and go ahead and get started. Okay. Well, I would like to go ahead and call this meeting to order. This is the Flagstaff City Council regular work session. Today is Tuesday, September 29th, 2020. Just to remind everyone that the Flagstaff City Council has the ability to recess into executive session for legal advice should we so choose to do so. With that, can we please have Ms. Whelan uh, do our Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you, Mayor. If everyone could stand, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Whelan. Vice Mayor, can you please read our mission statement? It'd be my pleasure. The mission of the City of Flagstaff is to protect and enhance the quality of life for all. Thank you so much, Vice Mayor. Can we please have roll call? Mayor Evans. Present. Vice Mayor Shimoni. Present. Council Member Eslin. I'm present. Council Member McCarthy. Here. Council Member Odegaard. Present. Council Member Salas. Present. Council Member Whelan. Present. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we're now down to item number four of our agenda. Item number four is for public participation. Public participation is for items that are not currently on our agenda. While we can listen and receive input, we cannot respond back to anything that we might hear during this particular time for a law. City Clerk, do we have anything for public participation? Not tonight, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're now down to item number five. Item number five is a review of our draft agenda. This will be for the October 6, 2020 uh, City Council meeting. Um, Council, is there anything you'd like to um, chat about on next week's agenda? I do not see anything. So I'm going to go ahead and move down our agenda. Just as a reminder to council, if for some reason you do have some questions after the meeting is over with, if you could please forward those to our city manager so he can make sure that he and his staff get that information back to you in a timely manner, it would be appreciated. We're now down to item number six. Item number six is our COVID-19 impacts on the economy and local businesses. The Economic Policy Institute from Northern Arizona University's Frankie College of Business will be doing this presentation. Um, Dr. Guzman is going to be leading it. Just as a reminder to uh, council, this particular item is very specifically has to do with um, the COVID impacts to the economy and to the local businesses and to this presentation. Um, any uh, other COVID related um, comments, remarks, um, concerns that we have related to health, those types of things, we will talk about that in item number 10 of this agenda, which is our COVID-19 update. Mr. Guzman. Mayor Evans, uh, members of the council and other distinguished guests and attendees, it's uh, really my pleasure and a great honor to address you here today. And I wanna thank you for the invitation and your interest in, in our work. Uh, as, as much as we are interested in the well-being of Flagstaff and our recovery for the Flagstaff and the region. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm not seeing what we're displaying. So I'm a little. I see September 29th at the bottom. So that's the cover slide. And do you have the agenda slide? It should be showing the agenda slide now, is it not? I don't see it, but maybe others do. It, it is. The agenda slide is showing. Yes, okay. we do see it. So uh, it might be because of uh, I came in through the web browser, so I will. I see a gray screen, so just have to keep me on on um, reminding me of what slide we're on. So we're on the agenda slide right now. Uh, so I'm going to go through quickly here. I have um, a few slides to go through, so uh, we might uh, jump over some of the detail. But um, I will make these slides available uh, to anybody who likes who wants them, and of course you have my permission to distribute them. Um, so I want to go through. Uh, a little background on, on the EPI and a slight update. And uh, my favorite slide in any presentation is the bottom line up front. That way I avoid death by PowerPoint uh, to whoever's attending and watching. Um, here we go, now I, can, I saw it for a second. Um, 
And then I'm going to summarize the pulses and with a particular emphasis on Flagstaff and uh, try to answer some of this, some, some with some suggestions on how to assist the community. Uh, uh, next slide, please. All right. So the Economic Policy Institute is organized along project centers and we've, we've grown and I think we're firing on but mostly all cylinders, except for some of the limitations that have to do with uh, the hospitality work that we do. Um, but we have a Center for Business Outreach, which is a university center sponsored by the Department of Commerce, the Center for American Indian Economic Development, uh, Seventh Generation Money Management, which is a large project that stems from CAIAD, uh, which uh, is focused on financial education uh, for in a tribal environment. Uh, we um, we have we work with the Hospitality Research and Resource um, Center, and we are also uh, work with the Rural Policy Institute. We have a road scholar activity, which is academic excursions uh, in the region, and uh, that's not doing well right now. But we hope for a big pivot and rebound. And we have two new centers that are very very important, I think, to students uh, and and uh, speak to our student focus. One is the Center for Civic and Financial Leadership because we understand the well-being of students after they leave really depends on their financial independence and their ability to express their civic voice. Uh, and the other is Leaders on Fast Track, which attempts to accelerate uh, students and their careers through information access and networking. So basically, our, our, our main activities are regional impact. We want to be everywhere in the region. Um, and I mean that. Uh, we want to be notable by our absence if we're ever not present. Uh, we through uh, tribal economic development also is is a primary goal for us and for our president, for president of the university, President Cheng, and leadership and technology policy at the intersection of technology and policy, and 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 um, um, market acumen where it might take a little help to get some of the technology work going on in the university to market or to application. We we uh, we work in that um, space as well. Next slide, please. This is our 45th year of the Economic Outlook Conference. We are not uh, going to meet in person, unfortunately, but we are going to uh, uh, meet by Zoom or a, a similar platform on November 12th. And uh, we hope it's a we hope to expand and, and make best use of that of the electronic platform for our Economic Outlook Conference. And I, I hope that you will all um, feel welcome to attend. And if you have any questions, please feel feel free to contact me. And uh, lastly, in the preliminary slides, um, is that I want to thank all of the task force participants without whom we would not have uh, been able to reach the uh, compact and in informative uh, survey product that, that we uh, were able to put together. And one more thing, and this is, you, some of you may have seen this meme already, but it, it says a lot here. And this is a couple that is uh, sitting in their garage or standing in their garage with uh, makeshift podiums uh, and uh, attempting to look really professional, sound really professional as they're presenting charts, one with an iPad, one with a one with a laptop, and they've stood that laptops and iPad on boxes. They're wearing their comfortable clothing. You know, a year ago, nobody would have understood this meme. But today it's part of our lives. It's showing how much the world has changed and the working world uh, is changing and will continue to change. And uh, there will be, you know, we'll get through this. There will be Silver linings, it will be great opportunities for the region and for Arizona, but not no question that this is a very, very difficult time we're in. Bottom line up front, well, the most thing, one of the most uh, noteworthy things that we saw, oh, sorry, next slide, sorry. Do we have the bottom line up front slide? You are there, Dr. Guzman. Uh, it still comes in and out uh, with, with a gray screen and sometimes I flash of, the, of what I should be seeing. So bottom line up front is that uh, one of the most noteworthy things from the survey is uh, the resilience of small business, especially when we began the survey at the depths of the of the of the shutdown, uh, there were there was talk of of wholesale, maybe even majorities of businesses and small businesses closing. We're not out of the woods yet, but the resilience was really uh, encouraging from small businesses. When we asked the question, uh, "Are you are you closing? Or do you plan to close?" And um, uh, the, the answer was resoundingly no. Um, we, um, we we can look at our surveys for the exact numbers, and and it's all available on the website. 
but uh, t- between two and six percent were that was the range of our small businesses indicating they'd be closing, which is a lot smaller than what you read about. Um, now, this is a self-selected group, understand, but but um, it was a representative survey nonetheless. Uh, we've seen consistent improvement in the indicators from the from the trough uh, from the lowest point, but we uh, we do see a little bit of a slowdown. And there were significant variations in sector performance. Uh, construction, of course, did quite well. And one of the things that was also observed is that some businesses, as you all have probably seen, were redesigning their business to accommodate the current setting. Example of that is uh, is restaurants that picked up a lot of business uh, through takeout and specialized and redesigned their kitchens for that kind of work, and or for that that to accommodate more takeout business and less. Uh, in uh, on their main floor business, some some businesses have still kept their their floor going. So as I mentioned, the recovery may be slowing, but there's um, there's a ray of hope. And I guess yesterday's news that uh, that the the house had worked through a new CARES Act. So let's see how that goes in the coming days. So Coconino and Sedona County. Why would we do Coconino and Sedona? Well, we we uh, had a, a a task force for all of Coconino, but um, Sedona jumped in, and they at the at the last minute they said we'd, we'd like to join the task force, and they were extremely cooperative, and they uh, they were able to uh, join us from the very first pulse. We had five pulses uh, that that um, that began in early May, and the last one ended just last week. Uh, I'll also tell you that uh, the methodology was very important because we had complete cooperation from all of the uh, all of the participants in terms of aggregating lists. Of, uh, of businesses and allowing us to coordinate the sending out and and uh, respect all the uh, the privacy and the anonymity of the of the respondents. So what do we see here? Um, in terms of businesses open from the lowest point, Williams was at the bottom, and now they're at about ninety percent. They were at forty percent of businesses or under forty percent were reporting being open. Um, Sedona had a, a similar comeback, and they're at over eighty percent. Uh, Flagstaff was uh, the highest on the list of, of county entities re- reporting, uh, and uh, but the, the main point here is that the businesses were on an upward trajectory. Um, operating capacity, and this is, I guess, interesting because uh, sometimes the operating capacity did not match what was going on with the businesses, uh, and uh, mostly they were not... Um, seeing the same revenues um, and you'll see this in the next slide. So a lot of businesses were at, at uh, suboptimal operating capacity, but nonetheless open. And what you'll see here is that uh, loss in terms of loss and revenue, uh, their businesses were, were uh, not mapping their operating capacity, the diminished operating capacity to the revenue. Some were open, but not serving, but some were uh, open at a, at a, at a, something a, a little above 50%, but they were, their revenue by personal estimates were, was at uh, 70 to 80%, so it exceeded that. Uh, we asked businesses whether they had had to engage in layoffs and furloughs, and you see that that's trending in the right direction. It's, it's gone way down, and we're pleased to see that. Uh, we also asked businesses if they had applied for aid, and along the way, we were um, um, incur- we were we you know you you find things along the road, and what we determined was there's a big difference between applying, being accepted for aid, and receiving aid. And um, this particular chart shows a, a percentage that had applied for aid, uh, and in general, it seems to have. Um, uh, evened out at about 50% of businesses, and that was consistent with other surveys we did as well. Uh, and then we had uh, a, an open-ended uh, question that uh, ended up falling into a finite number of categories. And this is, what's the biggest hurdle to re- return uh, business to, as usual? And uh, you see at the, at the very beginning, uh, you had uh, keeping people safe was a big one, and um, the most the most important was uh, paying your bills and uh, uh, keeping your employees uh, paid and also the cash flow. Well, we had a big dip there in those, 
And we see here that in the, in the last pulse, that's returned as a, as a prominent concern. So, and uh, you see that, that uh, there are a couple of others, but um, they're, they're all on the top of everybody's list and there was a consistent uh, return to these, these same issues. Consumer confidence is really big, especially given that we're in the hospitality industry or largely in the hospitality industry. So I wanted to present a couple other slides that, um, that came in on the last pulse only because we added this question on the last pulse. We wanted to just uh, see if there's a big difference between what was going on in downtown Flagstaff versus uh, Flagstaff in general. And, uh, and you, you see that there is, uh, of course, the sectors, you would expect those to be different, uh, more hospitality oriented. Um, uh, but also, are you open for business? Now, I think the downtown sector tended to be a little more open for business than, than the rest. Uh, and now, we had also percent operating capacity that seemed to be fairly similar, not too far off. Uh, thank you for keeping up with me, by the way. <laughs> I'm going really fast, but I'm also fl flipping through them uh, because I can't see the slides. So, uh, but I can see that you're, you've kept up with me. And then uh, lastly, uh, how, how, is, how are you operating compared to normal? I want to share a couple more slides with you here. And keep in mind, I've gone through them very quickly, but you're you're welcome to uh, go through them and even uh, send me questions or contact me if you'd like. Uh, the big question is, what can we do about what's going on? And, uh, you know, you get great ideas from uh, listening to folks. And so I would like ask you to go down to the uh, Flagstaff uh, slide. And this is uh, a... a uh, distillation of uh, some of the some of the uh, ideas that that came in um, I, I like a couple of them in particular i'll highlight on the far right in the middle please continue to keep people safe or implement measures to keep people safe uh, you have another one keep parking free and suspend business license fees well i'm not sure about suspending everything but i think it has been uh uh, a, a plus to be able to come in and out of downtown more easily without worrying about the parking. On the other side, continue to promote Flagstaff. Get employees in the communities to support our local restaurants and businesses. And I'll have you all look at them at, at, at your leisure. But there were a lot of good suggestions there uh, coming straight from the people most the people most affected, which are the business owners. And with that, you didn't think we'd get through twenty some slides. Uh, but we did uh, in a short time. So questions, comments, and uh, I'll conclude. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Guzman, for that um, presentation. Council, are there any questions? That's great. I do not see any questions. So you, you did a stellar um, presentation. I know that some of us heard some of the information during the NACOG retreat earlier today. There are two uh, council members that would like to ask a comment or have comments now. Um, I'm going to go to the vice mayor first, followed by Ms. Whelan. Thank you, Mayor. And, and yes, thank you so much for the presentation. This is the second time I've seen it today. And, and, and well, um, it, it was very good. And I appreciate all the speakers earlier today as well. But I re I, we really appreciate your work and your time on this. And helping us keep an eye on what's going on in the community. And and yeah, interesting times, you know, and it, I'm really curious to see how this pans, plays out and, you know, how we continue forward, um, given the uncertainty around health and safety. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Ms. Whelan. Thank you, Dr. Guzman. I certainly appreciate uh, your presentation. I believe that the last time uh, I was able to see a presentation from the policy, Economic Policy Institute, it was way back at Pulse 3. So it's, it's very interesting um, and uh, taking with light heart the projections and and where we've gone so i just wanted to thank you very much thank you for your presentation today uh at nacog and um 
thank you for this new data tonight. Yeah, and I, I'd just like to point out that I um, uh, began with uh, very different approaches with NACOG versus versus us because we are including uh, the, the other counties, especially yeah. Yavapai. Mm -hmm. um, and this one, uh, we focused a little more on Flagstaff and we had this downtown business question, which is useful. But but the consistency in the uh, in the in the in the outcomes is also part of what's going on. We're facing the same problems, exactly. uh, even though we have some sector differences. We we're facing the same problems, and I I suspect that we uh, join forces on solutions. It'll be a great thing. Thank you, Mr. Odegar. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Dr. Guzman, uh, for the presentation. Uh, I, I know, you know, that last slide you had, um, you know, there was comments uh, provided. I was just out of curiosity, what's one thing that you would have a piece of advice uh, to leaders in the community um, going forward with our business community? You know, you know, there's talk about safety, uh, talk about promotions. What's one piece of advice you would probably have for leaders in our community about going forward? Well, uh, that's a great question, and I appreciate the question. Um, I'll, full information, I'll, I, I, I'm going to draw from some of my conversations that also took place today with this SBA Small Business Development Center board, which I'm, I'm a member of. Um, and, and my suggestions there were to focus on the smallest businesses. Because our small businesses do, you know, first of all, we know that uh, small businesses account for over 50% more than their share of, of growth, economic growth. You know, they're 44% they're of small of all businesses are small businesses and two-thirds of all growth comes from small businesses. Um, so I would focus on the smallest businesses and keeping them in. And I, part of the reason is because it, it doesn't take a lot to keep them going as opposed to major investments in larger businesses. And so they're uh, they're quick, they, they can pivot as we've been using that word a lot. Uh, I, and um, the other thing is in terms of consumer confidence, uh, one thing we did uh, with EPI on our own, not our own, but through in coordination, but it was on our, as an initiative from EPI is to uh, submit this COVID aware um, uh, training for free to anyone who had the food handler training from the county and uh, along with a certificate. Well, just the spirit of that of that um, training, uh, which was to capture the, all the guidance that, that, that's out there that, uh, and hopefully give, give customers, especially in the hospitality industry, uh, greater confidence. Um, we, would, we, would, we would be happy to continue to participate there and, uh, and expand that. And uh, when, when the requirements become more formal, we'd be, we'd be happy to, uh, to provide the ex expanded training that incorporates that. So, um, you know, I know hospitality is huge for us and uh, and it's kind of like a bread and butter, no, pet, no pun intended. But um, I think that if you if you stick to the, the main points, the, the big things, I think everything else takes care of itself. So I would say hospitality and all small business. Well, thank you, Dr. Guzman for uh, that thought. Ms. Salas? Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Guzman, and I look forward to attending the the, the conference. The, yeah, the economic outlook. I think this will be like the fifth year I'll be attending, but f for the first time uh, virtually. Um, I am grateful for all the work you do, and of course that. And the, and the work of the Economic Policy Institute and, you know, capturing uh, the pulse by pulse data, you know, understanding that, you know, the, the current hurdles of businesses pretty much in the region, not only in Flagstaff, but, you know, uh, the major challenges are, you know, paying bills, keeping your your uh, cash flow and uh, lack of customers or tourists for, for tourist related businesses, um, things not being fully open yet, consumer confidence, social distancing, keeping people safe 
and planning with uncertainty. Now, there's a major challenge for Flagstaff businesses after January 1st, uh, which, was, which is the higher minimum wage. So are you going to repeat uh, are you going to conduct another survey, let's say, covering the first quarter of 2021 and include that question specifically to, uh, you mentioned, you know, to the, to the micro small business owners we have in Flagstaff? Uh, that's a fabulous question, uh, Council Member Salas. So uh, we have agreed to consider expanding and continuing our survey. I, I, um, I think that the context of the future survey, as you're pointing out, is going to be very different from where we are right now. So I think it calls for a different sort of approach and maybe something that, that could result in more actionable um, um, strategies. Uh, so so uh, the short answer is yes, we will uh, be conducting another survey. We're going to meet again with the task force, um, and and uh, uh, on, on whether we can, how we can address that particular question. I'm not 100% sure, but you know, you've all seen. You know, we have mi very mixed signals here in our local economy. We have, of course, our uh, insane uh, real estate market, right? Uh, it's probably going up faster than pro almost anyone's, uh, and then we we also have have um, other indications that the economy may may slow, but we also have this uh, this the the, the, the real estate uh, research entities are kind of saying that this change in people wanting to live in Flagstaff or towns like Flagstaff is is uh, permanent. Uh, it, it it is not a, a passing fancy. Just like it's not it's not exactly a, 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 a tourist issue. It's really people that want to move, and so. We we have we have a, a possibility for for growth and pivoting, and I, I uh, would be happy to entertain anything that will help inform uh, the council and the county decision makers that way. Um, thank thank you, Dr. Guzman. I have a follow up question. Sure. Um, uh, with re with regard to um, future, and thank you for also mentioning that. You know our businesses in Flagstaff are are highly resilient. They have this 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 ability to uh, adapt to new ways of doing business or providing uh, services to their customers and delivering services in a a non physical contact way and ability to evolve and pivot. Um, so we are keeping the the number of you know closures at at a very minimum minimal rate um i am curious uh, per, uh perhaps in in the future future uh data collection in the next survey is you captured it in in, in uh, previous pulses uh of how many businesses were able to rehire their employees yeah and uh i i want to hyper focus on uh the state of underemployment uh, okay. In yeah. terms of how many, what percentage of Flagstaff workers have been rehired, but not at a full time, not at a 40 hour work bit, but instead of like uh, a part time or half time into like a 20 or 25 hour work week. So, so th th those are the kind of stories that that um, I want to capture in, uh, in the state of our Flagstaff workforce because well I'm also wearing my my county workforce development board hat as I'm part of that. Thank you. Yeah, so um, that's another uh, fantastic point uh, is the underemployed and uh, we will see that in our Bureau of Labor Statistics data. Uh, it, is, it is growing uh, and uh, uh, it, it would probably uh, we'd have to give it some thought on how we would address it in a qualitative way because the, the the intended value of our survey was first of all we didn't we wanted we wanted to survey business people we didn't want them to have to have a a lawyer and, and an accountant on either side they just they could give their impressions and their sentiment because there are hard data that are being collected and so that qualitative sense of does give you a, a an indication of direction. Uh, and whether it's positive or negative, and trend, whether it's rising or decreasing. Um, 
with the with the underemployed, uh, that's a that's a little um, that that's a that's a tougher one to get to because you'd be talking to employees themselves, not businesses. But I I think that that's a fantastic question, and it's and underemployment is a big issue right now, uh, and as it was during the last major downturn in 08. Um, so you have uh, multi you have about four or five categories of unemployment. The traditional one is U3, and then there's people who are underemployed, meaning they don't work 40 hours or they work less than 40 hours, or they work in uh, in a profession that they're that they're overqualified for. And and then or not their desired profession, and then lastly is those who have just given up on the workforce, and that number drops out and is hard to track sometimes. So it's a good point. Thank you, Dr. Guzman. My pleasure, Dr. Guzman. Uh, yes. I, had to, I had two. I had two questions for you, as sure. well. Again, I am very excited that you are here with council to have this discussion. I thank you for that. The first one I wanted to um, just mention and speak to had to do with our tourism. That was something that um, came um, came up during the NACOG uh, meeting, the value of tourism here in Northern Arizona and what that means to our economy. Can you speak to that briefly? And then I have one more question for you. Well, it's an extraordinary proportion of our, our, our total economy. Um, I think the estimates, I might be off here because I'm extemporizing now, I'm not looking at any notes, but I think it's over 27%. Uh, and um, um, not only that, but it but it uh, it, it sustains the economy during uh, important times of the year, right? Uh, and so uh, we have the, the winter tourism and we have summer tourism. Uh, I think that, uh, to, to take your question a, a different way is, uh, is it possible to support our tourism? And I think it, it really is. You know, the travel patterns are changing for people. A lot of people still don't want to fly, even though they, they, they might be able to. Uh, and um, I know that uh, one of our senators has pr presented a piece of legislation to provide incentives for people to travel locally or travel by car or travel in their region. And I think that could be a great thing. Who would want to come here? Right. Uh, I, I saw that and I know that we were very interested in it because it seemed as if the Arizona Department of Tourism and our senator was really talking about incentivizing people to travel locally, to travel within the state. Um, they were talking about leave no trace. And I believe it was the American Trips Act is what she was right. speaking to. <laughs> it um, was. Yes, it was. That's exactly right. Uh, and I, I, Do you agree? I think that could be a very big, big help and it could change patterns because once people to realize the value and the fun of, uh, of a local trip and everything we have because a lot of Arizonans um, because we're here we don't know we don't we, we haven't seen all the beauty that we that, that's possible here to see and, and vacation in. I know that's very true of most of us myself included you know because of COVID and we are now um, have less jobs and we're working out of our homes we have the opportunity to you know go locally and see things that we might not have had the opportunity to do before that. Um, lastly, I wanted to see if you could speak to the um, the issue of housing and affordable housing and workforce housing and how that plays into the economic um, the economic issues or the economic challenges that we have here in Flagstaff um, and what that means to our small businesses. Yeah, um, I, I I'm I'm going to uh, claim. Uh, ignorance on that because uh, I, I think a question on that for me as a, as the director of the Institute would really have to rely on what's what's our desired outcome, what is the, the core uh, measure that we're going to use, and, uh, and then how will we uh, go about figuring out our way. Um, you know we have an issue, it's clearly a problem with, with uh, local housing, and there's clearly also a charm that Flagstaff has that attracts people here. And I'd, I'd love to see see both of them fully accommodated. Um, how we do that, I think, as a, from a study standpoint, is something that, um, that uh, I have, uh, and I don't know if anybody else has fully uh, studied to get to the final, final answer. But I'd love to see both accomplished for sure. Well, again, I thank you so much for your time, Dr. Guzman. We appreciate you being here to share um, this information with us. And we look forward to having you again when the next study is completed. 
It's my pleasure. Thank you so much and have a great afternoon and evening. Thanks to all. Thank you. So with that, um, we are going to go ahead and move down to the next item. The next item is item number seven. This is Flagstaff Local, My Actions Matter Movement Results and a Path Forward. Ms. Hansen. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. I'm Heidi Hansen, the Economic Vitality Director. And presenting with me today are Ralph Schmidt, our Creative Services Manager, Michael Russell, who's our Creative Services Specialist, and I like to finally talk about him as our social media guru, and Jessica Young, our meetings and events manager. All three work for Discover Flagstaff, and they reside in this division. Um, we're here to share the results of our recent Flagstaff local um, first year movement, and we're also gonna be showing um, some ideas for phase two and our path forward. Next slide. Um, as a recap, I just wanted to remind you that Flagstaff Local My Actions Matter was and is more than another marketing campaign. It was truly a local movement. Uh, this movement shares the who. Um, the who this involves is our entire community. This is where we encourage and celebrate the actions of our residents who follow the seven pillars that we identified. And the why of the movement shares how choosing to buy a coffee from a neighborhood business, like for instance, with National Coffee Day or your vehicle locally, we're keeping the money in our community and enhancing everyone's overall quality of life. Next slide. The what of the movement is a reminder of our seven pillars. We identified shop Flagstaff, volunteer, be eco-friendly, donate, support education, mentor and vote as the pillars that we wanted to brand throughout this movement. Next slide. When we kicked off the movement, we asked the community to do four things, and they were one, to first sign up at flagstafflocal.com, two, to share their actions, three, to earn points, and four, to be rewarded. Next slide. Our target audience involved the entire community and our timeline went from October 30th, 2019 through June 1st, 2020, where we shared the program. We encouraged sh the sharing of actions. We gave out a lot of rewards and so on and so forth. Since the pandemic happened during the movement, we were unable to have the winners go to the Hullabaloo Festival, but they do have a ticket waiting for them when this event comes back to Flagstaff and we hope that is sometime soon. Next slide. This slide is here to show you how we did our marketing print creative. On the left hand side, you will see locals in the community that are well known like Deborah Harris and Eugene Munger. And then you see um, someone like Jay Uliberry, who's in the center here, who's a third generation um, Flagstaff person, much like our mayor. And what we tried to do on the left hand side to kind of share how they have inter interacted with one of the pillars and what maybe that pillar particularly meant to them. And then we actually, in fact, had 25 local residents that helped us um, by being the faces of this movement. And I know that you saw a lot of them. We did a great cross section of the community and we learned a lot about people that we knew a lot about and ones that we basically just met. On the right hand side of the ad, you will see um, that we talked about the uh, how they could take action and how they could earn points and all by going and encouraging them to go to flagstafflocal.com to first sign up. We also gave branding opportunity to our top three prize um, donators that you see on the bottom. Next slide. Here's an example of how we place some of our, our print advertising on the NAPTA buses. Not only did we do advertisements in all of our local newspapers, the Daily Sun, Flagstaff Business News, and the Chamber at 7,000 feet, we also um, put some kind of like moving billboards on, on the NAPTA buses as well. Click sli our next slide. And then here you see on the left hand side example of the website and how we shared the movement, how we allowed them to sign up 
and how we asked them to load actions and how they knew uh, they could gain points by loading actions. On the right hand side, you will see how we marketed also on build stuffers so that we could get more residents involved in the program. Next slide. This slide shows you uh, table tents, window cling, stickers, customizable retail posters that we had available for businesses and for residents to display. I'm very happy to say that many businesses actually use the poster to the very right. And in that center, they would put a fun offer that day for uh, someone that came in that was participating in the program um, to encourage them to, to shop Flagstaff or might have encouraged them to do something uh, by volunteering at their business. Some of the businesses actually even would put in that heart, um, let me show you how to upload a receipt. I, I thought it was a, a really great way to continue to get the branding out there and the businesses that helped us with that um, ended up doing quite well with the program. So now I'm gonna take a quick pause and I'm gonna turn this over to Michael Russell, our social media guru. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, Mike Russell, Creative Services, Social Media Lead. Flag Local draws its content from the sponsors who were involved early on, the city management and staff, and the supportive acts that have happened over the course of the time we've had Flagstaff Local up. The video portrayed here by Mayor Coral Evans brought in the highest reach and engagement of all the posts on Facebook. We also tagged sponsors and local businesses mentioned. Similar posts to these were shared on Twitter and Instagram in a consistent manner, growing the discussion and growth of the brand and other digital environments. Next slide, please. Flag Local had a Facebook presence since October of last year. Its timing could not have been better with the events that would arise in 2020. The ability of the Discover Flagstaff team to pivot its outgoing message from inviting visitation to that of supporting local Flagstaff businesses was vital, not only to the businesses that were struggling, but to the first responders and community fundraisers that came up. Flagstaff Local puts real citizens face forward and draws an interest with the authenticity of real people doing real things for the city. These images, as you can see, Sydney here sold lemonade, a lemonade um, stand for fundraising. We have Jamie, who's active in the community, um, encouraging youth in the classroom and theater to become future leaders. And these are just some examples of the kind of social media posts that we put out on Facebook and our other social media platforms. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Heidi. So as you know, when we first came out in front of you in 2019, we shared several videos that explained the movement and how we were going to urge locals to sign up and participate. Um, we thought it would be fitting to share a video that was going to be actually um, shown throughout the Harkins theaters, but the pandemic broke out and was never aired. Um, we wanted to share this with you because it was a great effort by our staff and by Bubba Ganter, who is a well-known local in this community. He's an actor, and um, I do believe he's actually a city employee now. So, um, Ralph, if you do me a favor and show that video, and if the video has any issues, Council, we'll make sure that we send it to you um, so that we don't keep this um, delay this meeting. Go ahead, Ralph. Hey. I see you still have your phone now. Are you scanning your movie ticket for FlagstaffLocal.com? Oh, you haven't heard? Well, it's a free movement where you sign up, you take action around town, you log your actions, you earn points, and you win rewards. It's simple. Learn more about the seven actions today. You know, it's the one time where you can be a true superhero. Okay, okay, it's time to put our phones away. It's, it's a show time. Thank you. Next slide. So with that, we had 846 people sign up um, to show that they wanted to share that their Flagstaff, um, that their local actions matter. 
And um, yep, Dan's sharing that Bubba is the newest code compliance um, officer and <laughs> um, we're excited to have him. And we were excited to have uh, Bubba be able to participate. And we were sad that we weren't able to show that video um, during the time we were uh, literally days away from getting that to start showing at Harkins and then the pandemic broke out. So we just wanted to make sure that you saw that the efforts went um, very far um, past what you just saw there. So next slide. So um, basically, I'm going to turn this over to um, Jessica Young, the next two slides. Jessica. Perfect. Thank you, Heidi. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor and Council. Jessica Young, Sales and Marketing Manager for Meetings and Events. For the rewards portion of the movement, we had two ways to earn rewards. One, by signing up and taking the pledge, which automatically entered you into our weekly drawings. And second, by logging actions and earning points to be entered to win a grand reward. We received over 200 rewards that were donated by local businesses that wanted to be involved in this program. This allowed us to give away five to six weekly rewards to both the 20 and under and 21 and over categories. You can see some of our weekly winners in these photos. Next slide, please. Our three grand rewards were a sit-stand workstation from Quality Connections, a pair of giant bikes from Flagback Bike Revolution, and a Pepsi summer retreat from Knackered Pepsi that included $1,000 cash, a year supply of Pepsi, and a variety of logo Pepsi items. These photos of our three lucky grand reward winners picking up their rewards. We shared these winners on social and in print to continue to encourage people to sign up. I will now turn it over to Ralph Schmid to share statistics and results. Thanks, Jessica. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. I'm Ralph Schmid, Creative Services Manager. Um, prior to diving into results, I wanted to share a few statistics we collected from phase one of uh, Flagstaff Local. So on the left here, um, you see statistics based on gender and age, which show the strongest engagement came from females ages 25 to 54, then followed by males 25 to 34. And um, just to pick out a few in the least engaged group were females 18 to 24. In the top right, you can see what devices were used to engage with Flagstaff Local. And that's kind of surprising too. Uh, desktops were mostly used with 4,501 views, then followed by mobile devices with 2,912 views. Uh, bottom right, the contest summary actually shows how many people engaged with the point tracking so we had 7,681 views and 7,591 total entries. So moving on to results, I'll guide you through all the or through each of the pillars. Uh, Shop flag staff had by far the most engagements. There were uh, 5,800 entry points earned and 1,160 entries. Participants uploaded receipts totaling $128,099, but I think it's fair to say that only a, that only represents a fraction of actual dollars spent. We had hoped to see more engagement here and more dollars spent, but we realized not all part participants logged receipts or they grew tired of the process most likely. Uh, you can see some some samples of shared photos here. Some chose to upload a photo of the actual purchase instead of a receipt. As an example here, there's a purchase from looks like Aspen Sports, the Sweet Shop, Steep, Kickstand, and I don't know what that delicious thing on the top right, it must be a chimichanga, I don't know where that's from, it looks delicious. Next up is uh, Donate. I do want to point out, I think it's safe to say that 
Due to COVID-19, the ability to take actions was limited with the stay home order in effect and the CDC and city guidelines. Uh, donate had 275 points earned and 55 entries. And again, here's just a few examples, such as donations to Habitat for Humanity, the Navajo Nation on the bottom, second to the left, Goodwill, and looks like Head Start as well. Eco-Friendly. Eco-Friendly had earned 232 entry points and has had a total of 116 entries. Here's a, just a few examples of the community's creativity by reusing plastic bottles, litter cleanups, water collection, riding the bus, riding bicycles, recycling, and, and also using reusable shopping bags. So we got a diverse, some diverse submissions there. Vote. Although there was no voting during the reward portion of Flagstaff Local Phase 1, we did encourage to register to vote and vote earned 220 entry points and had 22 entries. And we mainly received uploads with pictures of uh, voter identification cards for, for this pillar. Volunteer earned 142 points and had 71 entries. Um, on the middle bottom, you see Love and Contracting. They actually organized their own cleanup. There's volunteers at the Flagstaff Family Food Center up top, uh, the Girl Scouts, and volunteering at uh, High Country Humane even. And those are just a few highlights we're pointing out here. Uh, support Education. Support Education earned 58 points and had 29 entries. Here's a few examples. A computer donation was made. Um, the career fair at the Co Coconino Community College. And up top there, it looks like we got Mayor Coral Evans at an event at Markets of Dream. Yep. Dreams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, Pillar Ment Mentor. Mentor earned 20 points and had 20 entries. Um, some examples are Girls on the Run on the right hand side. Moonshot by Nayset, Kirsten Hathcock, telling her story to uh, upcoming entrepreneurs. And these are kind of the results we collected for our pillars, and I'd like to uh, turn it back over to Heidi. So um, we decided that after looking at our results, the best thing to do before moving forward was to survey um, our participants. So we sent out a survey to the 846 participants to see what we could learn from them about the movement and um, what, what we could do that might, you know, what we could maybe change possibly. So the first question that we asked um, was about logging into flagstepplocal.com where we asked them if logging was easy and convenient. And as you can see, more than half that answered the survey said they agree or strongly agree that logging in was easy. And then some of the comments that they shared were somewhat slow loading and hard to navigate. They remembered my password, everything was easy. I had my login info saved, so that made it easy. Next slide. Here we asked if they agreed or disagreed that uploading actions such as photos and receipts was easy and convenient. And I'm gonna be straight up with you here, it was a very mixed bag. Um, to see that 42% that answered neither agreed or disagreed made us then look at the comments, which you will see some answered that, some answered that way because after they signed up, they never logged in action um, after sign up. Some said this because they didn't actually find that loading receipts um, seemed safe to them. And in some cases, some felt that loading um, actions or and especially receipts was actually bothersome. So we um, have taken that into account when moving forward. Next slide. 
We also asked um, if an app would have logged, if we had an app, would they have logged more actions? And 46% said yes, with the remainder in the no and unsure category. Uh, many comments were shared on this one that said that the website option wasn't that difficult. Um, many didn't have trouble logging in, but again, they just weren't very interested in logging every action. And after six months, it got to be quite tedious is some of the other comments that we had received. Next slide. We asked what they would like to see in the future and hands down the comments um, were that they wanted more notifications. So they wanted us to actually bother them more. <laughs> so we um, decided that we were going to figure out how to do that in a, a good way in our phase two approach. And then it was very obvious that many liked the rewards because we got a 62% that it was an incentive for them to participate. Next slide. And then this slide I wanna say means that absolute most to us, it was a question where we asked our locals, what does the movement mean to them? And as you can see from some of the comments, um, it's they're very heartfelt. You have things that people said, it reminded me how much the community of Flagstaff looks out for each other. Locals supporting locals. I like seeing faces I recognize. And I'd like to tell you, I, I think our 25 faces for, for doing this um, free of charge for our community. They said things like, I thought this was a great movement. Given the pandemic circumstances, it is more important than ever to support local businesses. So again, um, there's comment after comment on that. And these are things that we're gonna use moving forward when we continue to market. Next slide. So of course, when you do a lot of marketing and um, again, we, we got some good pricing on our marketing, so we didn't have to do uh, too much of that. And we of course didn't have to buy any of uh, the rewards because they were all donated. You still wanna see what was the, the way, the best way for someone to figure out how do you become a Flagstaff local or how do you sign up? And social media was our top um, way that people found out about the Flagstaff local program. Um, Arizona Daily Sun was helpful and then referred by a friend was at 18.6%. And what we found about that was the reason it came in third, it was basically, um, the way that they got referrals from social media sharing. So when they said they were referred by a friend in comments, we knew that, that they were being referred by seeing something that maybe another friend posted and then they shared it, so on and so forth. So we took this information, we studied each page of the total survey packet and all of the comments, and we developed a phase two approach that we would like to re recommend to the council to this, to this afternoon. So what I'm going to do again is turn this over to Ralph um, for him to go over some of our recommendation and then we will end with me. Next slide. Thanks, Heidi. Yeah, so I'll cover the uh, path forward a little bit here. Um, for the path forward with Flagstaff Local, we, we recommend uh, to move away from what was perceived to be a rather cumbersome uh, point tracking system. Uh, phase two will be focused on social media, where we saw the most engagement in phase one, despite the fact that we only partially promoted Facebook and later introduced Instagram and Twitter. Um, social media allows us to really engage with an already existing and larger audience and to grow it while providing an easy and more effective way to engage as well. Uh, again, so the main focus will be on social media with an already existing audience of uh, 2,117 followers. The website will continue to be live and encourage to pledge and also serve as a platform to engage. Uh, in addition, we'll stay engaged with uh, the 846 participants via newsletters. And the visitor center will be able to accommodate submissions from individuals that may not have uh, access to computers, smart devices, or the internet. In essence, the visitor center will still be able to let them tell their story and uh, acts of engagement. Uh, 
Um, the focus of phase two is really to um, the focus is on educate, motivate, and engage. And we're looking at a timeline from October 2020 through June 2021. But please note um, the timeline is the timeline is for the uh, rewards portion only. So the monthly giveaways. Flagstaff Local will remain an ongoing movement as it has. Um, as far as the strategy is to educate on all the pillars via social posts, to motivate through actions taken and local opportunities via social posts, and to host uh, monthly engagement giveaways. So residents can engage by posting any actions on any of the pillars by entering into a giveaway on any of the three social media channels or through the website and will then be uh, entered in for a chance to win rewards. That's on a monthly basis. So here's a few examples of posts, uh, posts that support education of the pillars from our locals, such as here on the left-hand side, we got Sarah, the retail rock star. I like knowing that when I shop Flagstaff, my money stays in Flagstaff. Or we have Eric, our uh, nonprofit director on the right hand side, volunteers like you allow us to offer attainable home ownership to qualified families in our community. So we'll continue to do posts on to educate on pillars. Uh, how do we motivate? To motivate, we'll post winners of the monthly giveaways. We uh, inspire with posts such as the that's the middle one, Diablo Burger, who donated a meal to local emergency room or organization feeding hungry school kids for every meal purchased. That was amazing. Or opportunities such as to join Albert for the 30 day for 30 days to keep Flagstaff litter free. So there's all these opportunities we can share. Uh, one of the ways to engage will be, as mentioned before, the monthly acts of engagement giveaway. Residents can submit a photo, a video, or a brief description of how they engaged with any of the pillars that they would like to share to be entered uh, for a chance to win. To accomplish this, um, we can use the WooBox platform that uses an automated random process for fairness and there's no additional cost since we actually already have a subscription through uh, Discover Flagstaff for that service. And we'll also follow the same rewards uh, guidelines from phase one of Flagstaff Local so we don't have to reinvent anything there. Um, but to engage, there's more uh, is not limited to the engagement giveaways. Here's a few examples. We'll promote voting by encouraging people to share their I voted stickers. Uh, we'll point out, for example, National Pizza Day and encourage residents to share photos of their favorite local pizza place. Or we'll post about National Hair Day and say, Hey, it's time to do something about that COVID hair. Make your way to a local stylist. Share your favorite stylist. So these are just a few examples. And um, thank you. And uh, with that, I would like to turn it back over to Heidi. So it's just important to note that phase two approach that Ralph just shared will be marketed by us like our first phase was. Um, I also wanted to thank Ralph, Jessica, and Mike for presenting with me tonight. Um, so council, as you just heard, there has been a lot that went into the Flex Up Local My Actions Matter movement. Our phase one was a great start to getting the branding out there. It got some of our residents sharing their actions and several of our businesses helping to reward those actions, which is beyond cool. I think you can see with our new phase two approach that we will be able to engage more of our locals and have them share their actions instantly. We can offer fun rewards all while creating a real joy for others to join in at a more effective and faster rate than asking them to continue to log actions and receipts. 
And if this wasn't enough, our amazing Discover Flagstaff team will continue to stay in contact with the existing participants, which is now not just 846 of them, it's 2,117 of them, while acquiring new locals to join. And then we can share ideas on how we can um, do acts of engagement that we know will go viral. So I hope that you will agree with us that our recommendation to go to this type of a platform, which is an enhanced platform, is the right way to go. And so um, if we, this is all we have for you. Thank you for being so patient. It was a, a lot of work to put this together and it was a lot of work to run this. So it took a little bit more time to explain it and to go over it with you, but we have um, found a lot of joy in bringing this, this program to our community. So with that said, um, are there any questions? Council, are there any questions? Mr. Odegaard? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and thank you, Heidi, and your team uh, presenting. Um, you know, this is so important for our community of Flagstaff, you know, of trying to prevent dollars from leaking out of our community and keeping those dollars here in Flagstaff that in exchange, you know, with the taxes that are collected that we as a, a municipality can provide services here in our community. Um, so this is so important. Um, I really appreciate your efforts, Heidi, to make this happen and to be as robust as it is. And so thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Odegaard. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you saying um, the importance of not letting our dollars leak out of the community. That is exactly what this program is about when we talk about the Shop Flagstaff Pillar. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Heidi, so much for the update. And Jessica and Ralph and Mike, the Facebook guru. I feel like you and I should definitely be hanging out more, <laughs> but um, I think you all are doing a great job and I really appreciate the update. Um, I'm glad that our community is is looking for us to, to communicate with them more. I think it's a really good sign that we're onto something good and that we're onto something that's you know organic to the, the individual's experience in, in our community. You know, I think that this definitely hits a raw nerve in people's hearts and in, in, in their in their minds of just engagement and feeling a sense of purpose and belongingness here in Flagstaff. And it really feels you get a sense of community, right? I love the incentives. I think that's a great idea. Um, so Heidi, what I heard you say is that we're not going to be moving towards a um, app moving forward, but more so just kind of utilizing the social media platform and just kind of um, promoting the month to month raffles and whatnot, correct? Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, that is correct. We have found that um, even though an app would have been found to be easier to use, and you told us that at the very beginning, Councilmember Aslan was very helpful in acknowledging that at the beginning of the campaign, we had still decided to go with our website, which we had put a lot of work into. But what we found through the, the survey, but really through the comments, is that um, people don't really want to continue to to log the actions um i think they what we really missed the boat on was they were logging actions and putting them you know giving them to us but then we were in return having to then pick and choose and share where we feel like this approach gets everybody sharing all the time it gets someone to spontaneously you know go to their facebook their instagram or what have you and share their action right away and then hopefully you know someone else will share their action and this that the and it puts a little bit of less work on our team to pick and choose how to share and so i think it's going to um, end up seeing a lot more engagement and people aren't then afraid that we're even though everything was very safe on our site we did have a lot of people that said hey i, I didn't want to um, put my receipt on there. I didn't want to share those things. So it, it kind of eases everyone's mind that we're not sharing any confidential information, which of course the city did not. Um, but it gets us away from that and it gets people just actually posting and doing it um, organically. And in some cases we're going to, like Ralph had shared, 
when we are motivating them, we're going to talk about those fun little holidays. Like for instance, today's National Coffee Day, like I said, we we'll might post about, you know, show us your favorite coffee spot, show us your, you know, favorite barista. And the whole point is um, letting people realize that you're out there shopping Flagstaff and that you're appreciating the community. So that's really what we're gonna be working on. And don't don't worry, Vice Mayor, um, we're definitely gonna be doing a lot of eco-friendly um, stuff for our pillar and we'll be working with Nicole and sustainability. Um, we already work with them and we'll be utilizing Albert more to make sure that people understand um, a little bit about the cap and and how they can be helpful toward that program. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, and, and you can touch upon an idea I wanted to bring up as well, which is having themes, you know, like this month could be, you know, elections or census, right? And, and kind of like highlighting different themes throughout the year and different pillars and building little, you know, campaigns almost, like you said, with show us your, your coffee kind of thing. You know, I don't know, just like little themes like that that we can play off of. And and I like the idea of what you said about putting the power into the, the user's hands to upload their own. Um, we could even play off of the uh, the the just the building momentum idea of, you know, tag three friends. Right. And try to get like a ripple effect on some of these bigger efforts that we have. Um, and then I just want to say that, you know, I love that we're using Instagram. I can't wait for our city to have an Instagram, but I'm glad that we're doing it with this. And I, it sounds like it's being most effective, which is really great. And 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 yeah, you know, you can touch upon the whole ego thing. You know, as we're as we're heading towards um, a plan to be carbon neutral by 2030, I can see this campaign having a very strong um, role in helping us get folks out of their cars and, and changing the culture of which we travel. So um, great first year. Thank you all so much. I, I'm, I'm glad we're moving forward with it and we're, I'm glad we're um, growing and, and I'm very excited to see how this continues to progress. I appreciate it. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I just wanna let you know, I wrote down all your ideas and we'll make sure that um, we incorporate those. Thank you. Council, anyone else from council? So I just wanted to weigh in, Heidi, and say how much I appreciate you and your staff. I absolutely love Flagstaff Local. My actions matter. I truly believe this is the type of movement that we we needed in our community, and I think it came right at the right time. And I just want to express how much um, I think the continuation of the program is so important. So thank you. Mayor, thank you, and our team thanks you. Uh, you've been supportive from day one. And I wanted to let you know, as soon as we uh, the pandemic hit and we asked you to do the video um, that Ralph or Mike had to, had talked about earlier, and we you did the video and asking people to take the pledge, that really skyrocketed our number of signups. So we, again, thank you for um, helping us with this movement. And we know all of you will be helpful as uh, we move forward. Awesome. So with that, we're going to move on to our next agenda item. Um, and that is item number eight. This is a discussion plan on how to move forward with the development of affordable housing on the Schultz Pass parcel. This is the triangle at the Schultz Pass Road at Highway 180, including the discussion of a $500,000 general obligation bond question or something similar for the repayment of affordable housing monies allocated spent on Schultz Pass property in a future election. And so I wanna say that there's most likely not a staff presentation for this item because this is a discussion item that I requested. Um, and so first I'm gonna ask the city clerk if she has any public comment for this item. Thank you, Mayor. I do have five um, requests to speak, and if you'd like to take those now, um, I can start getting those folks on the line. I would love to take those now. Thank you. Okay, give me just a moment.
OK, Mayor, we've got our first public speaker. Her name is Christy Zeller. And um, Christy, if you would like to go ahead. OK, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Thank you for the opportunity to submit public comment and for your work on behalf of our community. As a 21 year resident of Flagstaff, I have seen this community change a lot over the years. The arguments we have today aren't that much different than when I arrived in 1999. At that time, the scandals of the day were the construction of the Barnes and Noble, the widening of Butler Avenue and others that now seem kind of funny in the rear view mirror. As Flagstaff continues to grow, however, I cannot help but observe that the solutions put forth for affordable housing are almost all met with community resistance. I can only label as NIMBYism. I'm writing today to express my support for immediate development of affordable housing on the city owned Schultz Pass parcel. The city has invested close to $600,000 in this property. It is frustrating, frustrating to see the process stalled. The city council in the 2000s voted unanimously to proceed after going through a rigor, rigorous public comment process. Our community is in the midst of several crises with the affordable housing at the top of the list. It is an issue that intersects with so many others. Our neighbors have waited long enough. It's time to build them some homes. If the city is not prepared to move forward with building before a potential voter initiative on the 2022 ballot, the parcel should be sold and the money recouped to build elsewhere. While there may be a lot of voices speaking out about saving the transitory sunflower field, there aren't as many speaking about affordable housing. The people in need of affordable housing are just trying to survive. These voices are in the thousands as evidenced by the waiting list for public housing and low income apartments. It is time to end this debate and move forward. Housing a few dozen community members may not seem like a lot, but imagine how these neighbors lives would be changed for the better. Thank you very much. Council, do you have any questions? Others. So many others. OK, Mayor, um, I will move on to our next caller. She okay. left the line just a moment. Thank you, Mayor. I have Devana McLaughlin on the line. Um, Devana, you can go ahead and start. Madam Mayor, members of council, my name is Devana McLaughlin and I have the privilege of serving as the CEO of Housing Solutions of Northern Arizona. And I'm sure it will come as no surprise to you all that I am providing public comment tonight to encourage council to move forward with the development of affordable housing on the Schultz Pass property. As you know, Flagstaff is facing a housing crisis and has for many years. And we really, I believe, as a community need to invest in housing anytime, any way that that's possible, especially with land and financial resources and resources that have been dedicated for affordable housing in the past. So I urge council to not delay development of this parcel and to create affordable housing for our Flagstaff families. Thank you very much. Any questions, Any questions for Devana? Devana? Thank, Thank you. you. OK, Mayor, we have David Hayward on the line. Um, David, you can go ahead and start. Thank you, um, Madam Mayor, Council members. Um, I'm coming to you on this issue tonight because providing housing for all is something I care strongly about. Um, I personally can't build houses at the price people need, um, and it bothers me every day. 
Um, I've heard repeatedly from this council um, and those that wish to be on it that the appropriate response to this issue is to let the people decide, put it on the ballot. I disagree. We have a system of representative democracy for a reason. We elect you as leaders, as leaders we trust, to make decisions on our behalf. Not because those decisions are easy, but because they are hard and nuanced, and they're never going to please everyone. This location is the best option we have to finally, finally get some affordable housing off the ground. It's on a major road next to a bus route, next to the urban trail, and has utilities for which the taxpayers have already footed the bill. Let's be honest, if you build on it, we will, as a community, lose something. Yes, those wildflowers will be gone, that view will be changed. Councilmember Odegaard, you stated that this is an important view shared recently. Sure, it's pretty to look at. But Mayor Evans, your colleague and friend, is not where she is today, our city's first black mayor and running for state office because her parents had access to views. They were able to succeed and pass that success on to their daughter because at one time the people of this town sacrificed some open space, sacrificed their greenery and wildflowers so their neighbors could have a chance at a better life. Those folks who oppose this project might not see that, but frankly, they had their chance. Council members Whelan, Odegaard, and Carthy, Mayor Evans, you were able to raise the signatures you need to get on the ballot. COVID or not, that shouldn't be used as an excuse. What we need now is the leadership we elected you for. We need your commitment to make the right decision for the future of our community, even if it may make you unpopular with a few people who do not see the value and the grace in sharing the blessings we have with those who need it more than us. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions for the speaker? OK, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mayor, we have Ross Altenbaugh on the line. Ross, you can go ahead and start. Ross. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, Mayor and Council, good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today. My name is Ross Altenbaugh and I am the Executive Director of Flagstaff Shelter Services. I am also a member of the Flagstaff Housing Commission, but today I speak for myself and for FSS. My comment today is to be a voice of support for housing. One of the things I know you hear consistently is lack of community resources in that area. Things such as grocery, transportation, and employment opportunity continue to be prevailing arguments. I am here today to remind the council of the direct link between white supremacy and nimbyism. Who we are who are we to tell someone else where they deserve or where they should live? I am also a member of the Flagstaff Housing Commission, but today I speak for myself and for FSS. Can you turn off your uh, computer? Ross. I'm sorry, it's confusing. That's okay. If you want to just mute your computer. Yeah, I okay. turned it off. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Go up. Go ahead. Okay. I'm here today to remind the council of the direct link between white supremacy and nimbyism. Who are we to tell someone who or where they should live? To assume they do not have transportation or even ignore that a bus line already exists in the area. These ideas have roots in the idea that we know better for families than they themselves do. And since communities of color are disproportionately affected by homelessness or the need for affordable housing, this is absolutely a racial disparities issue. At this point in Flagstaff, this, partial ha this parcel has a direct correlation to modern day redlining. We cannot continue to be okay with affordable housing only happening in other neighborhoods. A recent article from August 2020 from the New York Times highlights a city on the East Coast, my hometown of Richmond, Virginia. 
In this article, Richmond's formerly redlined neighborhoods all the way back into the 1930s are on average today in 2020, five degrees hotter on a summer day than green line neighborhoods. Satellite analysis reveals that. Some of the hottest areas where communities feel like it was appropriate for affordable housing can see temperatures 15 degrees higher than wealthier, whiter parts of town. This article points directly to the kinds of resources, transportation, and stores available in those communities that involve higher levels of concrete and less tree-lined areas. This can have devastating effects on the communities that reside there. As you can see, where we build matters, a thoughtfulness of infrastructure is required. And from the votes that came years ago before us, that thoughtfulness has already been ha- has already happened and is now at your feet to carry on. If we do it right, these units could help contribute to the beauty of this community. There is evidence already emerging that environmental justice lies in new and sustainable building. Getting people home is beautiful and iconic, just like the view itself. Bottom line, we can do better. For the people FSS serves every day, for our work in social justice, for our community, each housing unit matters. Thank you. The view is majestic, thank but you. so are what we can do today. Ross, thank you. Ross. Yes. Okay, your time's up. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Just a um, moment, Ross. Uh, Ms. Salas, you have a question? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, I have a question for, for Ms. Altenbaugh, if, if she's still on the line. Yes. Hey, uh, uh, thank, thank you for, for uh, your time and your um, uh, perspective. So what are your idea in, in terms of 100% uh, of the units that if and when housing is built in that property, um, 100% uh, should be affordable to low income families. Well, I would lean directly on what has already been voted upon um, when it comes to our past. I mean, that um, those resources has, have already been infrastructure um, contemplated. And, you know, for me, any housing in this community that equals affordable housing is good for all of us. Um, and so whatever that looks like, you know, personally, I love the idea of people that can't afford um, some of the housing prices now. I love the idea of those people getting to have not poverty with a view, but housing with a view. And, um, you know, whatever that looks like, I would be excited about one unit is great news for me. Would you also support uh, an idea that um, some of the units uh, would be for rent, long-term rentals for low-income uh, families? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? I don't see any. Do we have another speaker? Um, we do, just a moment, Mayor. Mayor, I have Sulia on the line. Sulia, you can go ahead. Hi, y'all. Um, I'm just calling um, to speak about uh, the housing situation that's happening here in Flagstaff. Um, a little bit about myself. I am a person of color. 
um, living here in Flagstaff as a student with making less than $10,000 a year to survive here. My only thoughts and concerns about creating uh, affordable housing and something that's very contested within our community, especially when it comes to our natural resources, is that um, it won't be a sustainable practice. Um, only if it's developed in a way where you can train the people to utilize uh, water to a minimum or save their electricity and stuff like that. There's a whole education process that needs to come with um, creating affordable housing because there are other costs associated rather than just money um, when it comes to living in Flagstaff. Um, we are one of the first international dark sky cities. Not only that, we also have issues with our own water supply and what that looks like in the future if we provide uh, any type of housing, all housing, any development in the future, we have to, you know, take the sustainable aspect of it into consideration. Um, I, I'm all for affordable housing, but let's, my alternative that I would offer is I found a group of people that are working on a co-op um, housing, which is a beautiful opportunity that's rooted in the community, very little to no money, um, and working with local resources. Um, that's all I have for today, but thank you. Okay, is there any questions for the speaker? Uh, City Clerk, can you please re-provide the name of the first? Thank you. We have that now. Are there any other speakers? Mayor, um, that was our last speaker. I don't have any further comments. Okay, thank you very much. So council, um, normally I um, wait until the end to speak. Um, I defer to you all and then I speak last. I would like to have the opportunity um, tonight to start the conversation, um, especially because I'm the one that brought this conversation forward. I want to acknowledge um, that this conversation is most likely coming at a difficult time, um, or it'll be a difficult conversation. It's coming at somewhat an awkward time for some of you, but I do believe that this conversation is one of importance. Um, so if you don't mind, I'd like to go ahead and start um, with my remarks. I also do have uh, some lengthy remarks tonight. Um, normally my remarks are brief, but because of the history of this project and the history I have with this project, um, I uh, wanted to spend a little bit of time on that. So there's been a lot of questions in the community as to why I brought this issue back up, why I brought it back up now, um, what am I thinking, and the why. And to be very clear with council, um, my tenure is ending, and I will be leaving council. And this is the one issue um, on my list that has remained unfinished. Um, indeed, the, the concept of a meaningful, affordable housing for our community is one that has been very elusive. Um, and it has been elusive for every council that I've been on. Since 2008, council has talked about the need for affordable housing, mm. yet for Listening some reason now. we have not been able Listening to um, meaningful, meaningfully address I'm listening right now. So, in 2017, this particular issue came before that council. And our community went through a series of difficult meetings and conversations trying to determine what city property, property was appropriate to be used for affordable housing. Um, at the very last meeting in 2017, um, this particular property was part of a bundle that we were trying to send forth to get um, a developer to look at to do affordable housing. And um, during that meeting, it was very clear that there was a group of citizens that did not want this piece of property in that particular bundle. And they were saying very clearly that they were going to go and pull a citizen's initiative. And um, they wanted to preserve this property as open space. Now, I was there listening to that conversation and um, I decided that, or I thought to myself, that if this particular piece of property was bundled with the other two and we sent it out for an RFP 
and then citizens did pull an initiative on the property, it would be very unlikely that any type of a developer would be willing to help us with affordable housing, and we would end up waiting until the issue was decided. That particular com um, committee, that particular group, was very clear that they were going to pull a citizen's initiative. In fact, we were told that. So this was in August, in two it was August 2017. So with that understanding, I changed my vote. I changed my vote to allow the citizens the opportunity to go forward and put a citizen's petition on the ballot. And um, in doing that, we decided on a different piece of property. And then we were able to move forward without any issues um, from any community members on those three pieces of property. Now, the idea was that if a citizen's initiative had been pulled at that time, this issue would have been decided in November uh, 2018. So in June 2019, um, I brought the issue back up because nothing had been placed on the November ballot. Um, at that particular time, um, the same individuals, many of the same individuals, they came back to council and they said, no, we're going to pull a citizen's initiative. And so they went and they pulled one with the understanding that this issue would then be decided in November 2020. So basically in a month, in a week, right? Um, so in July, um, I checked with the clerk and I found out that this issue would not be coming before voters um, until maybe November 2022 because the citizens group had decided to continue um, their, uh, their petition. Um, they decided that they were um, going to go ahead and continue to collect uh, signatures. It's my understanding that they had over 4,000 signatures but they wanted to have 6,000, so they decided not to submit their petition. And they decided not to um, withdraw their position, but rather to continue it. So I want to go back and make sure that we understand that this started in August of 2017. So um, if we expect a petition to be turned in, it would be turned in maybe in November 2022. And the reason why I say maybe is because at the same time, um, in looking at what was going on on the different Facebook pages, I also observed the fact that this, the citizens group had um, started having candidates, future candidates for council, to take pledges saying that this piece of property should be permanent open space. Now, I want to just mention that if, for some reason, this actually ended up on a ballot in November 2022, that would be five years, five years. A lot can happen in five years, especially if you're housing insecure. So I brought this conversation back to council because I really wanted to have this conversation. Um, and really my conversation has to do with um, equity, democracy, ethics, um, and uh, responsibility. We often talk about the need to hold our elected officials accountable. And it is with that in mind that I ask for this item to be put on the agenda for a discussion. Because I also think it's very important that we as residents, and I am including myself in that statement because I also live here, we as residents, we as community members, and we as participants in a society that we hold each other accountable as well. Now, in 2017, at the end of the meeting, I said something after I changed my vote that sparked a controversy. I said that I was disappointed. And I want to take a moment to elaborate on what I meant by that. We as Flagstaff discovered a planet and we helped put men on the moon. We gave birth to a medical manufacturer whose medical devices save lives on a daily basis. We are home to a level one research institution whose professors specialize in forest health and cyber security. Here in Flagstaff, we train and produce Olympic athletes. We are Oscar, Grammy, and award winners, painters, poets, and authors who are world renowned. We lead the state in climate action and adaptation planning and in water conservation. We are doctors, we are scientists, we are teachers, we are painters, we are public safety and government workers, we are dishwashers, retail clerks, and groundkeepers. We are capital and social entrepreneurs. 
Yet we have been unable to meaningfully address the issue of affordable housing and the social justice issue it has created in our community. Yet somehow, in all our greatness, we are unable to see that it is possible to have housing for those who need it and the view sheds that we dearly treasure. When I said that I was disappointed, it was not directed at any one group, at any one them, at you, or it was not directed at the others. Rather, I was talking about the we, the us, myself included, and our inability, given the greatness that we have accomplished as a community, to meaningfully and holistically address this long-standing crisis that we have in our community regarding housing for our workforce and struggling families. We have managed to save open space, conserve water, land on the moon, but we have not addressed the need to protect our human capital, the young people and families, to provide that sense, that element of diversity to make sure they remain here. These are things that our community also needs. In fact, when I stopped and took a look back at what we have managed to do regarding affordable housing, these are the numbers that I found in looking through the sheets. What I think is very interesting for us as a community and as our council to understand that were it not be for the development agreements and the developers coming forth with those, our city would not have produced much in the way of affordable housing. I think it's very interesting because per Arizona state law, cities and towns cannot require affordable housing within a rezoning application and developments are not required, developers are not required to provide any. Yet each time we ask, again, we ask because we cannot require, the developers that we tend to demonize have continuously committed 10% of their development for affordable housing. For example, right now, since 2000, I went back to 2013, um, there has been 339 units promised, okay? 27 of those have actually been built. One was built with no city money, no help, okay? Of the, of the 339 affordable housing units promised, 284 of those units were the result of a rezoning or development agreement. And 192 of those units are currently under construction. So 192 units are currently under, under construction and those are all because of a rezoning or development agreement. In the same amount of time since 2013, we have preserved 2,551 acres of open space. Since 2012, if you go back one more year, we can add one more affordable housing unit to the houses that have been built, but we can also add additional open space. So since 2012, we have preserved 3,029 acres of open space. I think it's very important to point out that we paid for those. The citizens of Flagstaff, we actually bought and purchased that open space. But the city of Flagstaff's housing department has never had that kind of funding. They've never had that type of money. So in that same amount of time, we have 27 affordable units. Now, I want to address the issue that brought us here. The issue that we have a citizens group that has decided to continue a citizens petition and um, is asking the community or has decided on behalf of the community that we're going to wait a total of five years. Um, and yet at the same time, they have gone out and they have asked current people running for office to pledge that this will be open space. I think there's a conflict there. I think, you know, I am not an attorney, so that would have to be settled by an attorney whether or not that is that type of a conflict. But definitely I feel that there is an ethical um, um, issue are questions that should be vetted. It's very interesting because I've been on council since 2008 and at least once every two years with every council there is a conversation about ethics and why this council or why we as council members do not have an ethics policy. I would strongly suggest that whoever is currently remaining on council and those that are sworn in um, and on the new council 
that the first thing you guys need to do is you need to establish an ethics policy. And that ethics policy needs to be vetted and it needs to be in place. Because I think if there was an ethics policy in place, then we could have the conversation about is it fair to, on one hand, be asking to continue a citizen's petition to tie up property um, that could be used for affordable housing um, because we're not sure if a developer would actually go forward and develop it because there's this issue. But then on the same hand, be um, asking um, future council members to commit to possibly simply changing the designation when they get seated, especially when we're telling the community that we want the community to actually vote and decide on the issue. I think there's questions there. So I, I would like to close with this. Now, there's questions of who gets to be represented and how they're represented. Do the people who don't have housing and are working the two and three jobs, of which I was one of those people until COVID, do they get to have the opportunity to be represented in the same way? Or is it just people who perhaps are better off, who are who have their houses and who have in that higher that hierarchy on that pyramid are farther up so they have time to perhaps pull citizens petitions to have um, their representatives take pledges who actually has access to democracy and the fairness and how equitable is this situation and perhaps for the citizens of Flagstaff who are listening who need affordable housing Perhaps they need to make their candidates take a pledge, a pledge to support affordable housing for families and essential workers here in Flagstaff. Or perhaps our council can decide that we could have both. We can still have a view shed, but we can still have affordable housing. You know, and lastly, I guess as someone who is a third generation daughter of Flagstaff, who lives in the house that her, her grandfather built in 1942, I guess I'm very thankful that the people that were here in 1941 were accepting of my grandparents, right? And I wish perhaps we were just as accepting of new people in 2020. So that's all I have to say on this issue. Council? Mr. McCarthy? Well, thank you, Mayor. I do have some thoughts on this. Um, we're getting an echo. I don't know. I don't know why. Um, my first thought is about the three site projects. Um, we, I strongly supported the idea of the uh, three site project. And uh, when it came to a vote of council, I agreed that we should take Schultz Meadow off of that three sites. We did find another site, um, and the plan is to have that go forward. It was going forward nicely until the developer uh, backed out for reasons I don't quite remember. And uh, we've temporarily, as a council, decided to use that money for some other housing issues uh, this year. But I anticipate that it will come back uh, soon, and I strongly uh, hope that it does, Th those three scattered site projects. Um, and under the category of good news, uh, Starpoint on Fort Valley Road will be providing 77 new housing units that will be permanently affordable. 90% uh, of the project will be affordable housing permanently. Um, as far as the vote or the issue here tonight, um, in a way, I have to say I'm disappointed that the people that were pushing for the initiative did not get enough signatures to get it on the ballot this November. Uh, I do understand that there were some challenges with the virus in getting signatures. As one of the uh, commenters pointed out that uh, I, among others, I had to contend with that to get on the ballot again. But um, I do feel that it is appropriate to wait 
at least till 2022, when they can next get that on the ballot to get this before the voters of uh, Flagstaff. Then the voters will have the chance to decide if this should be permanent open space or if it should be left to what was previously uh, slated for the property, which is uh, affordable housing, of course. So my basic position is that I believe that we should give the people pushing the initiative until 2022. I certainly would not give them want to let this go any longer than that. Um, the other thing is that I guess there's some chance that the next council, which I may or may not be on, might be asked to rezone this property to uh, open space. Um, I also think that would be inappropriate. I think if we're going to wait and for the results of a citizen initiative vote, that we should wait for a citizen initiative vote. And so that's my basic position. And what the people decide in 2022, I will respect that. So that's my basic position. And I'll listen to the other council members. And, and I may have some more comments after I hear what other people are thinking. Thank you, Mayor. Ms. Wheelan. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a, a little bit of data from the 2014 November, I'm sorry, 2017 November housing availability, attainability for Flagstaff workforce. At that time, three years ago, 25% of our homeowners were second homeowners. Uh, at that time, 14% are, was a, the cost of living. We were above the national average. 43% of households are renters, and they paid over 30% of their income in for housing. Um, the median sales price for a single family home was 350,000, requiring an income of over 90,000. 22% of our population is considered extremely low income. 60% of rented households in Flagstaff are cost burdened. The 45% home ownership rate is strikingly low compared to statewide average of 63% and a national average of 64%. We are in a housing crisis. We were in a housing crisis way back when uh, the council said that this property was going to be put in trust for affordable housing. We were in housing crisis when uh, this study was done in 2017 and when we were talking together uh, with the other council and now this council um, in order to take this parcel forward, knowing full well that $500,000 of taxpayer money has already put, been put into this parcel, preparing it for affordable housing. I'd like to correct Council Member McCarthy. Schultz, Safe Schultz Metal did have all the signatures they needed to put it on the ballot for 2020. They chose not to. They made a choice for the entire city when they chose not to. I say we move forward on this property. I say that people take a priority over this parcel. 
It has been stated since 2000 that this parcel is ready to be built on for affordable housing. And I would ask my colleagues that we move this forward. Thank you. Mr. McCarthy has a response. I'm gonna let him go first. Then I'm gonna to go to Mr. Odegaard. Mr. McCarthy. Well, thank you, Mayor. Uh, yes, uh, Ms. Whalen, I do agree that they had enough signatures, but I believe the concern was that they didn't have enough signatures with margin, considering that if someone challenged them, um, that they would not have enough valid signatures. As we all know, something like 30% of signatures can be invalid. So I think they were concerned that if they turned in the signatures and got challenged, which was quite possible, that the initiative would have been rejected and thrown off by the courts. So I think their strategy was, well, we better wait and get some more so that we have enough margin to make sure that we have enough valid signatures. Council Member McCarthy, I'm glad you feel comfortable speaking for them. Uh, I do not. I got this information from our city clerk. They had opportunity to hand in those signatures and chose not to. We were all facing the same dilemma. And we got them in. Thank you. That was my understanding. And if I'm not absolutely correct, then I stand corrected. But that was my understanding. Thank I'm gonna, you. I'm going to move on to Mr. Odegaard. Thank you, Mayor. Um, since uh, this is all part of the discussion, I was wondering if I can bring up with the question that was in our agenda concerning the 500,000, um, maybe as a potential general obligation bond ballot question, but also the question of the repayment of affordable housing monies um, that may have been allocated or spent on the Schultz Pass, Pass property. Um, I was wondering, um, can we get the lowdown of the history of that? Was housing monies used was it i've seen um where maybe just general funds money was used i was wondering if we can get the actual truth of how those monies came from and to be used towards this parcel is that a question that could be answered um from our city team or are they not prepared to answer that Mayor and Council, this is Shane. I believe Rick Tatter and Brandy Suda are on the call and in a position to help field some of that question. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council, uh, Rick Tatter, Management Service Director. Um, we are in the middle of doing research of where and what those funds were. Um, the monies were clearly played out of the housing fund. Um, the question that we are looking at is whether those monies were restricted from prior development agreements, uh, prior uh, land sales, uh, which went into the affordable housing fund. And we just don't have the final answer on that. But it was a combination likely of possibly land sales as well as general fund contributions. The question becomes is, is how restricted those funds were. Can I please follow up with that? Um, I want to let council know that I actually um, had asked um, for a case study to be done on the history of the Schultz Pass um, project. And I'm hoping that um, once it gets vetted through um, all departments, that will be available on our website and available to um, the city council but when you look at the history and i happen to have that in front of me it says in 2005 the flagstaff city council chose to incorporate the schultz pass parcel into the city limits and at that time the property was designated for the purpose of affordable housing the city paid 140 
thousand two hundred dollars for the land and four hundred and sixty five thousand one hundred and sixty seven dollars for the public improvements necessary for future housing development. This included engineering, surveying, the installation of public sewer and water, sidewalks, telephone lines, electricity, and national, natural gas. The total cost of the parcel and the public improvements was $575,367. Affordable housing funds resulting from the sale of other parcels for affordable housing purposes was utilized for this purpose. And so um, this was done by Sarah Langley, who's one of our, um, our um, management analysts um, for our office. And so she's just currently vetting some other parts of the case study, and then it'll be available for public. But that part right there is what she was able to track down. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Okay, Ms. Whelan. I withdraw my comment, Mayor. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor, and, and thank you everyone for the discussion uh, and to those who called in as well, of course. Appreciate everyone's concerns around our uh, housing crisis, obviously being a huge issue in this community ongoing. And, you know, with our earlier uh, presentation from NACOG and, and the, the conference that occurred earlier today, you know, at the root of all of our economic potential issues is housing and, and we all know this and and housing is health care and so i i understand that you know the community is is pushing back on this and you know i think that our community has been a little bit shuck into its core in regards to development a lot of us who got elected you know and ran in 2016 um knew that that was a big driving factor and it's still true today right the development uh seems to be of a big concern to the public. And, and my hope was that there was a way to balance um, development with our needs moving forward and specifically to this parcel. Um, but before I dive into that for a second, I just wanna say, you know, council is addressing our zoning code and we are making adjustments to that zoning code to better meet the needs of the public. And, and obviously with the rezones, we always try to get the best project for our community and as the mayor said, you know, we, we, we get a, a decent amount of uh, affordable units um, out of those negotiations that are not required, um, but yet offered by the developer. So I was very supportive of us moving forward with this parcel when we had those conversations and felt that there was an opportunity to do it right and develop properly. Um, and I was very bummed that, you know, we didn't even get that, co that conversation because then the citizens initiative began. Um, I've also understood that they they didn't feel or some of the leaders of that initiative didn't feel like they had enough extra signatures to properly submit it and that they were just going to carry it forward for a couple more years. But Mayor, I, I hear your frustration and 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 yeah, it's been it's been a it's been a long time talking about this parcel. Um, and then just in regards to the candidates and what, what's being discussed amongst having candidates, you know, vowing to vote to rezone this parcel. I'm not interested in that. I think that's, um, I think it's problematic. I think that we need to stick to the plan. If, if this council is not going to address this topic, that we need to let them vote on it. And, and, you know, if the next council were to want to rezone it, I would just really find that to be an issue. Um, so at this point, you know, I, I feel like we need to let this, uh, like Councilmember McCarthy said, at least let 2022 play out and in hopes that they do submit the signatures and get it on the ballot. But this is a tough one. You know, I think we really do need housing and it needs to be put and dispersed all across our community. Um, so I'm just kind of listening to the conversation, but those are some of my thoughts. So that's where I'm at. Thank you, Mayor. Does anyone else want to weigh in on the conversation? Not seeing anyone else weighing in on the conversation. Um, I would just, we have Ms. Salas followed by Mr. Aslan. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and I, I am deeply appreciative of the um 
very thoughtful and informative discussion. And thank you, Mayor, for for laying out the history of the parcel and you know originally intended for housing and and now there's a you know there's a group of citizens wanting to save it but made the decision not to put it forward in the ballot that doesn't preclude the current council to discuss the future of the parcel, which we are doing now. Um, I do want to see this discussion move forward about uh, developing it to housing uh, with three caveats. You know, since this is city owned property, you know, make sure that all the units are attainable, affordable. I don't know. I I will rely on on the expertise of staff in terms of you know AMI. I know it's current. It's 80 AMI. Um, you know, you can make it to 60, but of course I would rely on on the the expertise of um, our um, housing staff uh, recommendation. The other caveat would be. Um, making some of the units um, apartment style, like rental, uh, for those who cannot afford to buy, uh, even, you know, if you make them affordable uh, to buy a house at this time. And then third, possibly some restriction on um, the building height but I would love to see this discussion move forward as housing where it was originally intended for stay the course. Mr. Aslan. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Vice Mayor and Council. Boy, um, I, I'm remembering back to our inauguration night uh, two years ago when our city attorney, Mr. Sterling Solomon, said something on the order of, I wouldn't wish this job on my worst enemy. And uh, I remember coming back with that with a pretty nice quip at the time. You know, it's, if, it, if it was a choice between me and my worst enemy sitting in my seat, I'd much rather be the one making decisions. Um, but now I think I get what he was talking about. This is a tough one. This is a really tough one. And I'm going to be very candid with everybody tonight because I know that passions are very high. I know there's a lot of misinformation out there. I believe there are some funny games being played, um, but the general public of Flagstaff deserves my full authenticity and transparency this evening. Um, and I'm not trying to uh, split hairs here. This is really where I'm where I'm sitting. Personally, I don't have any problem with affordable housing going onto those three acres. I'm very concerned that the other 70 acres are going to be developed at some point in the near future anyway. I don't have a personal emotional connection to those sunflowers and to that, that piece of land. I know that a lot of people do. I've had conversations and I know that um, just because it doesn't really matter to me doesn't mean that it doesn't matter to a lot of people. Um, I also uh, fundamentally believe in my core the things that Mayor Evans was saying about social justice. And I came on board council, and one of the first things I did was uh, defend Thorpe Park against being developed into affordable housing because I believe historically it was a park and precedent demanded that it stay that way. And I'm proud of that decision. And I'm very proud of... Um, Jim David's letter to the editor today, I, uh, Charlie o Odegaard and myself were the two council members who went on that walk with him with the city manager and discussed the ways in which we're going to ensure that that park space gets respected as park space. Um, 
And I don't believe that the the sunflower patch over by Cheshire is anything resembling close to resembling um, habitat, much less critical habitat for wildlife or for whatever. So this is where I'm at. I, I, I see the value to moving forward and putting housing there. But I also, I'm genuinely, honestly, authentically curious what the town as a whole thinks on this matter. I would love to see a rigorous, uh, scientifically um, robust and sig statistically significant type of polling be done to find out what we should do there. Because people have different views on this. I sit on one side of it, but I, I respect and value the folks who voice their opinions on the other side of this matter. I, I'm afraid, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the only way that we can really get that accurate poll is to survey the voters. Uh, that's the best way to do it. Now, I'm also very disappointed that uh, you know, I supported the effort of, of letting the petition process move forward. And I'm disappointed that the Save Schultz Meadow folks weren't able to get their stuff together and they're, and they're hiding behind COVID as an excuse for that. Lord knows if I were running for council this year, as three of our current sitting council members are, um, they weren't able to hide behind that, and I wouldn't have been able to hide behind it either. In fact, some of those same people would have really thrown that in my face. Um, so I don't, I don't want to play any games here. Uh, I don't want to see this thing bounce forward to 2022 and then have a new council change course on us. And I'll just be completely honest with you and... Sterling, I hope you're listening. If you need to uh, shut me up here, um, you're more than welcome to. I will. But I'm wondering how I can ascertain assurances that we have enough votes to allow. I'm talking slowly, just in case, um, to make sure that this is going to go before voters in 2022 and not be torpedoed in the intervening years. Um, I'm not hearing the city attorney speak, so. I'm here, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> I don't know I, if, I, I would love to hear from the voters on this. And that, it, that supersedes my personal um, lack of strong feelings on the issue in terms of its open space value. And my, my existence of strong feelings in terms of this is something that I personally don't mind seeing become uh, an amenity for the city in terms of affordable housing. Um, but I don't, if, if, there's, if there's not a guarantee that we're gonna see this in 2022, then I will be willing to move in a different direction tonight. There is never a guarantee that you're going to see an issue on the ballot. If it's a voter initiative, it has to be submitted by the voters. And until that happens and the signatures are verified, you don't have a guarantee. Sterling, I, I would like to uh, move us into executive session if I could. I'll second that. There's been a motion made to go into executive session and a second by my, uh, by Mr. There's been a motion made by Mr. Aslan to go into executive session and a second by myself. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Um, I would say that we need to end this meeting and wait for the city clerk to invite us to the next one. Is that correct? That is correct. So just leave this meeting. Um, I will call you and um, then we can rejoin this meeting when we're finished. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, we are now back from executive session. Uh, we are still on the item, item number eight. This item is about the Schultz Pass piece of property. Council, is there any further discussion? Ms. Whelan, Mr. McCarthy. I'll go to Mr. McCarthy first. 
Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, a question came up about do I have any conflicts of interest or ethical issues on this? And specifically, I was asked if I have signed the petition and I have not signed the petition. However, I did endorse the campaign to put the issue on the ballot. I don't consider that an ethical or conflict of interest issue. Uh, separately, I had a question. If we put the Schultz Meadow back on the three site project plan, uh, would one of the other sites that are included in that three site plan have to come off? And that might be a, a question for Sarah Dar or, or someone else on staff. Is there someone on staff who can answer that? Sarah's here. Mayor, Council, Sarah Dar, Housing Director. Um, so the three site project no longer exists. Um, that when it when the developer defaulted, um, those three sites uh, that that specific project ceased to exist. Excuse me for stumbling over my words as I try to compile them in my head. That's all um, right. Council staff is anticipating coming back to council to seek input on: Would you like to put sites out? or not. Um, the reason the third site um, for the three sites, let's see, let's review them for those that are listening and may not be familiar. <laughs> there is a site over off of West Street adjacent to Cedar Safeway. There's a site along Isabel adjacent to the BMX bike park. And the original site was Schultz Pass, the substituted um, site was the, the, at the intersection of Lone Tree and Butler, between Lone Tree and Eldon. Previous to that site going into the scattered site project, it had been RFP'd for commercial use with the any funding coming from that commercial use to go into funding future programs. When that site was pulled, was put into the Schultz, um, into the, when the Lone Tree site was substituted for the Schultz Pass property, we terminated the negotiations we were in to declare a responsible bidder to move forward with the commercial use of that property. So council could determine to put any sites in to um, direction to, to repeat a project similar to what the scattered sites were. In the meantime, we've received council direction to move forward with the, <coughs> excuse me, council, I'm going to cough for a moment. Okay, I think I'm not coughing. Um, Council could, we, in the meantime, council gave direction to move forward with the RAD program, which is a redevelopment of our public housing sites. So the intent of that um, process is to not only redevelop our public housing sites, but to increase the number of affordable housing units, uh, not only within our public housing sites, but on potentially other city owned pieces of property. That has been a lengthy process to put that procurement document together. We've been working with HUD, with procurement and with legal and anticipate coming to council after this discussion to seek direction on how council would like to move forward with planning for other sites. We did not want to come to council with this item hanging out there not knowing what the desire was. We wanted um, we wanted direction from council whether this one would be included in our next steps to come to council and say, would you like to move forward with 
including all city owned property designated for affordable housing to move into the comprehensive RAD planning process? Or would you like to move forward um, in a separate process to RFP sites for the development of affordable housing separate from the RAD process? We're anticipating doing that either late fall or early winter, uh, depending on a couple elements. Um, so council could move any site in or out of consideration for projects. Well, Council thank Member you, Sarah. McCarthy, did I answer your question? Yes, I believe I can read between the lines and say yes. In other words, we can go, regardless of what we decide on this one particular parcel, we can and will be moving forward on uh, some affordable housing efforts. Thank you. If that is Council's direction, yes, sir. Well, of course. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna go to Miss Whelan. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I have several questions. Um, Ms. Dar, when you were talking about those sites, um, could you tell me what neighborhoods those sites are, are in? Yes, I certainly can. Mayor, council members, the sites, um, the neighborhoods of the four sites that I just discussed, the 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 one adjacent to Cedar Safeway is just south of the Shadow Mountain neighborhood and north of Sunnyside. Mm -hmm. The Isabel site is located in Sunnyside. Mm -hmm. um, the Lone Tree and Butler site is located just adjacent to Sawmill. Um, could be argued that it is part of Southside rather than Sawmill or vice versa. Um, those are, and then the one out by Cheshire. And then there is another site that is over near Siler Homes that would most likely come into play as well. So my question is, um, do you have knowledge of what redlining is? Uh, yes, Council Member Whelan, I do. And can you explain that? Uh, to us and to um, our citizens, what redlining is? My knowledge of redlining has to do with um, mortgage funding. Is that what you're referring to? No, oh, I was referring to uh, making sure that your uh, affordable housing or low income housing is in certain neighborhoods. Okay, um, there is an effort by HUD and other other entities that um, are encouraging affordable housing to be scattered throughout communities so that equal opportunity is provided um, for those of lower income and that um, we've actually been told by HUD that we could be at risk for centralizing uh, the bulk of our municipal uh, affordable housing efforts in one area. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, Mayor, in, in your past statement, uh, you brought up that uh, candidates and um, candidates who are now sitting on city council have taken a pledge I believe offered by um, was it Save Schultz Meadow. So I would like to ask that the sitting um, council members, and that would be Council Member McCarthy and Council Member Odegaard, um, did did you take that pledge? I'm going to go to Mr. Odegaard first, followed by Mr. McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, Councilmember Whelan, um, yes, I did take that pledge as a candidate for uh, mayor for the city of Flagstaff, as I have 
taken a pledge to put on a ballot for 2022 affordable housing bond question. Um, as you know, during the campaign season, I've said to both of those um, that I preferred uh, uh, ask the voters that the question of whether what we should do to that project um, parcel, I should say. And I have not steered away from that. I have no desire as a sitting council member, if I'm so blessed to be the next mayor for the city of Flagstaff, to change anything by as a council body. So I would like this piece to be a closure for the community by a vote of the community. So you would support in in. I guess my next question would be, uh, Council Member Odegaard, uh, did you make the statement that you, or did you, once you took this pledge, uh, did you say that this was uh, about being a candidate and not being a sitting council member? Did you make that clear? Uh, I've always said as a candidate, and letting the voters decide on this issue. You know, uh, Councilmember Whelan, when we've had this discussion way back when, when we were newly el elected on the Flagstaff City Council, it was always my desire to see it um, as it is today. You know, we okay, had the discussion. So I, I, was, I was one of the four no's along with I, Councilmember Overton, Councilmember McCarthy, and Mayor Evans at, at the time. I was one of those four. I remember that. I was there. So I'd, yeah. I'd like to just, did you, before taking this pledge, say, I'm speaking as a candidate for mayor and, and let people know this was not about you being a council member? Never. It is about me being a council member. Never was a council member Whelan. And so it's about me as a candidate and also as a candidate for mayor wanting to see a ballot question 2022 concerning housing. You know, those are so, my pledges to the community as a candidate. I guess I'm confused. You just told me you said it as a council member. So well, I, I did say it as a council member back in whenever that decision was back in 2017. Mm -hmm. Ms. Whelan, did you want to move on? Sure. Mr. McCarthy, council member McCarthy, I have the same two questions for you. Well, first of all, I haven't taken any pledges to do anything. Way back when I was on planning and zoning, I learned to never, never pledge how I would vote on something. So I have taken zero pledges on any issue. Okay, However, and that's my mistake because no, what I no, heard. No, now listen here. Would you the please mayor say, me? Ms. Whelan, wait. Yes. I mean, who's the, we can only have one person speaking at a time. Do you want to hear my answer or not? I believe okay. I have. Okay, so let me finish. I have taken no pledges on this or any other issue to vote a certain way. Uh, however, I did endorse the campaign to put the issue, and by the issue, I mean the Schultz Pass, on to the ballot. Yes, I did endorse that campaign to put it on the ballot. Now, when I speak, I speak as Jim McCarthy. I did not say if I was speaking as a, uh, a council person. I, I can never speak for the council. I can only speak for my own self. And I realize that, and everyone I talk to realizes when I speak, I'm talking about my opinion. I'm never saying that I'm speaking for the council. Thank you. So I would like to go uh, move on from this um, discussion. Um, I would like to ask Sarah Dar a question because I want to make sure I understand what you said. 
because this is the first time I've heard that here tonight. You said that the Department of Housing or the Department of Justice is already looking at us because we're in danger of being, can you please go back to the redlining conversation earlier? Because I had not heard that before. Mayor, thank you for the opportunity to clarify. We have been, they are not looking at us. We have been cautioned by HUD, our personal, not our personal, our uh, dedicated HUD representatives for our communities. When we have discussed projects with them in the past to be aware of the fact that previous to the scattered site efforts, the bulk of our affordable housing work in this community where new units were created with direct city involvement and or support had taken place in Sunnyside. Um, that's where the infill units built in partnership with, at that point in time, the Affordable Housing Coalition um, and the other iterations of that nonprofit moving forward. That's where the bulk of those had been built. That's where the bulk of the Habitat for Humanity homes have been built. That is where we have uh, partnered to locate a domestic violence shelter, two tax credit projects, um, the Isabel Homes land trust project. Um, and while we are not being examined, we are not under investigation, we are not um, under, a, under a microscope. We have simply um, received a statement from our HUD rep in the past saying, um, you, you should be careful. And when he learned of the scattered site effort, and that there were sites contained in that effort outside of the Sunnyside neighborhood um, made an informal, that's good to hear comment. So I'm sorry if I was unclear with that previously, we are not under investigation. Council, is there any further comments? So um, to the city manager, I do not feel that you received direction. I'm just going to have to have you clarify that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Council. Um, appreciate the in-depth discussion here, uh, and we all uh, certainly understand the complexities. We have had indication from three of the seven on Council that there's a desire to move forward with this. And um, to my, from my notes, that is as far as we've gone with this, I, I believe uh, we have yet to hear from any other of the, of the other four that there's a desire to move forward. So with that, we are gonna go ahead and end this conversation. I would just like to say to council that I appreciate you um, allowing me to bring this back for, a, um, for an explanation um, on my part as to the history of this. You know, Mr. McCarthy did state that there was four um, to remove this from the original bundle, and I was one of those four. I wanna be very clear though, that I originally have voted yes, and then I changed my mind and allowed the um, group, I changed my mind to allow the group, the citizens group, to move forward with a um, citizens petition. That was in 2017. It now looks like there may or may not be such a petition in 2022. I will tell you that I have been on council since 2008. It'll be 12 and a half years when I leave um, in December. And this is the only vote that I have ever regretted making. This vote right here. I regret the fact that I changed my mind and that our community is now going to have to wait possibly five years to determine whether or not this is gonna be used for housing as it was originally intended. I wanna say that if you are housing secure, this is probably not a problem for you. And five years can go by in a blink of an eye. But if you are not housing secure, if you struggle to make your rent or to make your house payment here, then five years is a long time to wait. Again, I would also like to state to council that we heavily invest in the purchase 
of open space. We have purchased over 3,000 acres of open space with taxpayer dollars since 2012. I would hope that the next council coming would provide the same amount of money toward the same issue or toward the issue that we have, which is a crisis when it comes to affordable housing. Certainly, if we have monies to invest millions of dollars in open space, we as the city should have millions of dollars as well to invest in housing of the people that live here. And lastly, I want to say that council needs to have an ethics policy, and that should be absolutely the first thing that moves forward with the new council, because I think it could prevent some of what I see happening. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and move down to item number nine. Item number nine is a sales tax and revenue update. Is this Mr. Tatter? Uh, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council, Rick Tatter, Management Service Director. Um, just if I could just make sure you do see my slides. Is everyone able to see the slide? We are. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, tonight um, we are going to give you a, a quick update on our sales tax and revenues for the City of Flagstaff. Um, kind of tying into you know recent events with COVID and recessions. Uh, this is a, a valuable check-in to discuss where our revenues are for the city of Flagstaff. You are about to see a lot of numbers. Us finance people do like our numbers and uh, we'll try to summarize it and keep it high level as we can. Uh, we'll talk about what happened in the fourth quarter um, of fiscal year uh, 2019 2020 and talk about how we ended up the year overall and then we'll talk about the data we have so far for this year being for july and august and then following up as where we stand in our updates and projections going forward so starting off um here's you know march is when we kind of had the shutdown and uh, you know businesses were we're closed for the most part, and the third quarter of fiscal year 2019-2020, the fourth quarter, we saw a lot of changes in our general fund revenues uh, for that year. So what I've provided here is a comparison of uh, last year from April to June uh, to this year to give you an idea how drastically some things have changed in our community and our sales taxes and so forth. Hotels, motels, and short-term rentals had a 62% decline in that last quarter of last fiscal year. Uh, restaurants and bars had a 31% decline in that quarter. And personal property rentals, uh, which is like your rental cars and rental equipment, uh, those items, those sales taxes declined by about 22%. Our retail sales tax actually thrived during the same period as a comparison of last year. We have saw uh, increases each month during the uh, pandemic and the emergency clauses that were in effect and actually ended up with a 17% increase year over year. One thing that's kind of skewing this a little bit is that we have a new retail collection from the online marketplaces that are outside of Arizona. Starting in uh, November, we started seeing those receipts for the city of Flagstaff. And there was approximately um, 340 during the whole fiscal year of that, 340,000 for the fiscal year that were received. So that, that helped that time, but Overall, we saw a great increase. Construction contracting also saw growth in April through, through June. Uh, a lot of construction activity just continued during the events that we saw during that last quarter of uh, June of fiscal year 2020. And then overall, I, I didn't put the number on here for sales taxes for the year or for the fourth quarter, when you take the ups and downs, we actually had a 3% increase in sales tax revenue in the fourth quarter. 
One thing to note in our sales tax revenues, retail makes up approximately 50% of our sales tax revenue. So you can see when retail is thriving, it um, helps with the total tax revenue collection. For non-sales tax areas, uh, we saw some impacts to our state shared sales tax revenues, an 8% decline in that area. Our auto lieu, which is your vehicle registrations in that third quarter declined by 31%, uh, which could have been a result of people buying less cars or registering less cars during that last quarter. Charges for services dipped 35%. Um, that's not too much of a surprise as a great portion of our charges for services uh, are around our recreation facilities. Uh, and since those were closed, our receipts were zero for recreation uh, facilities. Building permits, on the other hand, in that last quarter, increased by 76% over the prior year. Um, We'll talk about that number on the next slide here as, as we move forward. This slide, uh, a bunch of numbers here, but just wanted to talk it through is the uh, categories of general fund revenues. These are all of our revenue categories with, with some exclusions. Uh, our budget is listed in the first column under yellow. The next column is the estimates we provided council in February at our retreat and that's to note that is what we used in our budget adoption uh, when we uh, had our april retreat and then our june adoption of budget so that's what we're basing the comparison on the next line is our preliminary actuals we're not quite closed with all of our books but we do have some preliminary numbers on our revenues in the general fund so i matched up the the comparison columns, uh, the actual versus budget, as well as the estimate that we provided in June or February versus budget. So as you can see here, uh, we'll go into more detail on the sales tax on the next slide. Uh, we brought down our sales tax revenues estimates in February. Uh, so our estimates actually improved versus what we saw in February. The state shared revenues, you can see in the estimate column, kind of going down the, that last column of the estimates, because that was our most recent numbers. You can see that really the, the only category that was hit a little bit harder versus our estimate was the auto loo tax or your vehicle license tax throughout our sales uh, state shared revenues. And then you get into the list of the multitude of other revenue resources the city has um, and we're comparing that to what our February estimate was in that last column. You could see that we saw declines in just about every category versus our estimate when we landed into year end. The categories that stood out are the building permits and our licenses and permits. The building permits saw a approximately a million dollars in permits that were paid in April of this year. And that was for two large projects that were coming on board and they pulled their permits at that time. So that was a big increase over what we were thinking uh, when we did February estimates. So in the end, uh, when you looked at what our February projections were, we were actually about uh, $1.4 million over those February projections, but it just between categories, it fluctuated quite a bit. Had we not had those uh, building permit, that million dollars or so in, in billion permits, we still would have been positive for the fiscal year in our revenues. This next slide gives you the detail by categories on how our uh, sales taxes um, performed for the city of Flagstaff for the fiscal year 
2019-2020. Uh, I'm not going to go through all these numbers, but it's set up the same way on this chart as a comparison to budget, as well as a comparison to our estimates. As we go through the green column to the right, comparison to our estimate, you can see that the, the major categories that uh, did not meet our projections back in February are that of the restaurant bars and that of the hotel, motel, and short-term rentals. Uh, those are the categories we saw large declines in that last quarter. And toward the middle, you can see construction contracting sales tax and retail sales tax thrived all the way through the whole fiscal year. Uh, so in the end, we are about 600,000 above our February estimates in our sales tax projections. So that wraps up uh, where we were at year end. So just in, in summary, uh, the general fund revenues uh, did perform well versus budget and versus our estimates. And this paired with our economic recession plan that the council adopted uh, in April and we moved to the significant stage in May also positioned the city well. So that was a, a, a good start and a good finish to our, our general fund for the fiscal year 2019-2020 and it positioned us well. So as we start to move into fiscal year 2020-21, uh, just a reminder, we did move into significant stage uh, of the economic recession plan. And this had a range of five to 10 percent or three and a half to six or seven million. We implemented a new revenue forecasting model at the end of last year. You know, we're looking at revenues month to month versus as a whole uh, and where the trends are. So uh, not just an annualized number when we're doing projections. We implemented the four separate levels of forecasting and that is what we've been using when we're comparing it to the recession plan so as of today we do have july and august revenues posted so we have two months uh, that have we gone through the summer months and we are exceeding our actuals and those projections we had back in april the question becomes what's going to come forward in our recovery uh, econ economists, economists are talking several different types of recoveries that could exist throughout the, the cities, the nation, and so forth. I'm not going to go into these, but, you know, we, we're still uncertain of where we're going to be at the end of this. There's several models that are being run. So this slide provides you with a snapshot of where we are for the first two months of the fiscal year. We have two tables that we're providing here and we're showing you the sales tax revenues and the state shared revenues that we received. So the first set of numbers compares July and August to the prior year. Uh, how did those numbers turn out? Uh, just in summary, you can see that this July and August, the revenues grew in sales tax by about $425,000, and it grew in state shared revenues by $609,000. So, so far this fiscal year, our revenues are exceeding uh, prior year's actuals. The next set of numbers uh, focuses on when we came to council and talked about the recession plan and how we were planning out our revenues going forward. Uh, we had a lot of concern back then. We still do. And we just wanted to show you a quick comparison to how we are comparing to those estimates back then. So here you can see lining up the 2020-21 the 20, 20, actuals for July and August were very favorable over what we were thinking when we put together those estimates in July and August. Approximately a million dollars above in sales tax and 600,000 in our state shared revenues. 
On this one, though, I'd like to point out is you really see where the the positives are again are in our construction contracting and retail. Those continue to be very strong for the city of Flagstaff in this first two months. Uh, part of those revenues are the online marketplaces, but that's not the only thing that's helping drive those numbers up. There was about 130,000 in online marketplaces for this first two months uh, of activity. So projecting going forward, we're still, you know, concerned about how we're going to pull out of this pandemic. Uh, what's to come? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, but our new scenarios range from a small growth in the general fund to up in an eight percent decline. And on average, we're right about the five percent decline. Uh, I'm showing you here what we were at in April. While we have approved, uh, we definitely should maintain the significant stage of our recession plan. Uh, I think we've done a great strides in developing that plan. Uh, the timing was great and we're just not out of the weeds in our projections and determining where we're gonna be. Retail and construction, can they remain strong for this organization? Um, I think we'll know a lot more in the next oh four months or so of of how these areas actually continue to perform. Uh, one area, you know, of concern on the retail side is you know NAU population is not back at full force as it was in the past. Uh, they have reported a three thousand student less enrollment on campus which is a 15% decline. So how does that, those trends at NEU impact our retail? We, I'm just not sure yet. So I, I'm cautious that the retail will maintain those levels compared to prior years. Uh, we'll see how those come out over the next couple months. Charges for services, we have a good feeling those will be continue to be down. I think we, we all know we're being cautious on open our, our recreation facilities and some of our other items that we charge for services. So we'll continue that trend over the next um, probably couple months, if, if not through the end of the fiscal year. And it's all this uncertainty that that really makes you want makes me want to proceed with caution. And, and we spoke with budget team. They agree with the caution. We're not uh ready to say we're, we're recovering we're moving in that direction uh COVID is still prominent in our community uh could there be future shutdowns due to this virus uh will we begin a, a vaccine uh, which will give some confidence but still with caution it will take time before that vaccine is distributed how are local businesses going to be impacted um you know, that's that's a big concern as as we pull out of this uh, pandemic, will businesses be able to maintain or recover and stay in business? Uh, the unemployment is high. How will we get people back in jobs uh, that needs the support of local businesses to get people back back to work? The minimum wage is a is a January uh, concern that We'll keep an eye on and see how that impacts our community. Air travel to our community has declined. Uh, we're keeping an eye on that industry and seeing how that. And the census, uh, how is that going to affect our shares of revenues? And we'll talk a little bit about that in a couple slides. So as you can see, there's still a lot of, a lot of concerns and a lot of caution with moving forward. So here is a, a snapshot of, of where we are at after we adjusted our revenues based on those first couple months. And this is our four scenario projection model we have for revenues of our sales tax and our general fund revenues. 
We, you know, I, I think it is helpful to, to understand that the budget adoption that we went through were the pre-COVID numbers and council uh, moved forward that and we appreciate your support on adopting a budget at that level. Understanding if, if revenues did come back, now we have the budget to spend. But this also gives us a great uh, a marker for comparison as we look at these projections and these scenarios. It's a great marker to compare where we thought we were going to be uh, versus how the economy is being impacted this year. So by applying the four scenario forecast model, we currently show as we look toward the bottom range, it's possibly up to a $260,000 decline in our general fund up to a $5 million impact to our general fund for the current fiscal year that we are in. Using the average scenario process, you can see we're in that 4.8, which is about 5% range. And while we've improved over where we were in April, we're still in that cautionary area and we should maintain that um, significant stage of the recession plan. On the uh, right hand side, you can see the comparisons to budget versus that four scenario. Sales tax are looking to possibly decline about 800,000 for this fiscal year over what was adopted in budget. State shared revenues seem to be maintaining pretty well uh, with our receipts, so small change there. And then going down to the other revenues for the city of Flagstaff, the largest impact that we're seeing is in those other general fund revenues. And of course, the main contributors to this is our charges for services. Uh, we expect a million dollar decline in charges for services for this fiscal year. Our fines and forfeitures are down um, by about a quarter million, as well as our investment income are is down over 100,000. There's many other contributing factors in here, but that is that just shows it's not all about sales tax revenues. It's about other services and fees that we charge uh, to run city government. The detail on the sales tax totals, um, I put at the end of the presentation for you, you to view at your convenience. I'm not gonna walk through all those numbers at this point. So that's, that's the general fund outlook. Of, of where we're at with our forecasting and I want to talk about some other funds and most prominently we're seeing our declines in our BBB taxes. Uh, we spoke to earlier how, how those were hit in that last quarter of the fiscal year and you can see that during this pandemic unlike several others this is the hardest hit category tax category uh, during this pandemic. Our actuals for fiscal year 19, 2019-20 were actually 9.5% below what our prior year was. We, we were 800, almost 900,000 below what we were projecting. For the scenario forecasting that we talked about above or previous, our 2020-21 fiscal year scenario, it ranges anywhere from a 9 to nearly 20% decline in revenues versus our projection. And that's an 800,000 to a $1.7 million impact. Uh, so we are working with those funds, are working with the budget team, talking about how we're gonna manage that. And we're having a lot of conversations around these revenues um, with budget team. But I wanted to share a chart that our uh, Convention and Visitor Bureau put together, Trace Ward and his team. Uh, they track their hotel industry uh, very well. They've been doing this for many years. And here is just a, a great depiction of what has occurred 
to our community in the hotel uh, realm and category. You can see February, you know, up until February, things were pretty consistent and pretty well in this um, area. But then you see the drop. April was a very bad uh, month for hotels, an 80% decline in the revenue per available room. And that's one of the major categories that they look at. And you can see it is, is increasing. There is some positive information here, but we are still about 20% below our rev par. Uh, the question is, is will that level out at 20% going forward, or are we gonna be able to gain any more from that for the rest of the fiscal year? And then with the help of our, our finance team, um, especially Brandy Suda and Heidi Derryberry, uh, their team are looking at all the funds for the city of Flagstaff. They've been uh, doing a lot of work, uh, not just with budget and year end, but trying to see how funds are performing. So there's a recap uh, starts with our general fund for the city of Flagstaff. And these are potential impacts. And I just gave you a low range and a high range. Um, we could fall anywhere in between here, or hopefully we can end up better than our low. Um, but this is where we're at as of today. Um, the general fund, that range BBB, we talked about on the previous slide. Transportation taxes, which there are several transportation fact taxes that make up this uh, revenue numbers. They could see a, a flat year or they may see up to a $2 million impact to the transportation taxes. Uh, of course, that includes transit, uh, the road repair street safety, the recent transit tax, as well as the Forest Street Bridge. Our pet park flag fund, uh, as we continue to um, not charge for parking in our parking plan, uh, we know that those revenues are not gonna perform as they were in our budget that we adopted, a range of 800,000 to a million. Our highway revenue, highway user revenue funds, that's our gas tax revenues that were received a share from the, from the state. Those, they did rebound quite a bit, but we still are forecasting a million to almost a $1.4 million decline in those revenues in this coming year. Our enterprise funds makes up many funds from airport, water services, uh, solid waste, and so forth. Um, this one's a little bit harder to pin down, but our preliminary estimates at a, at a higher level are at about a $1.8 million impact to almost a $4 million impact. And then here you can see our whole organization uh, what we may see with this fiscal year uh, for the city of Flagstaff. Uh, a low range right now and, and hopefully it goes lower going forward, but four and a half million to a high of 15 million. Um, it brings quite a concern and, and makes us want to continue with caution moving forward. The next slide is just a quick heads up and I'll talk about next fiscal year, not the fiscal year we're in, but there's concerns ongoing that we are keeping an eye on also. State shared income tax is one that is distributed a year after tax collections are made. And this number of a one, $1 million loss was provided to us in an update last week from the state of Arizona Revenue Department. They, so these numbers are known and, and the other impact to the tax returns was be, because they delayed when tax returns are due. So instead of being April when a lot of people filed, a lot of that revenue moved to July. And so it, it moved the fiscal year which that was reported. Census is something that's on our eye. I'm, I'm, I know it's on council's mind and staff is working hard to 
do the best with our census count in the city of Flagstaff as well as Coconino County. But I wanted to give you a snapshot of what a census impact would be to our state shared revenues. And this is just a 100,000 uh, people count, census count, undercount, what this would mean. Our sales, state shared sales tax revenues, $113,000 loss. Our income tax above the million dollar loss we may see could be another $145,000 loss as they change the allocations based on populations. The vehicle tax, uh, also a $50,000 loss, as well as HERF revenues, 77,000. And the reason is, is in the components of where we get our state shared sales tax, population is a big factor in receiving those funds. This also impacts our federal funds, uh, but we haven't looked at how, how those numbers are impacted of, of what funds we may receive from the federal government. So just, you know, to, in closing, you know, other items just to um, bring to council as, as far as informational, you know, during the fourth quarter, uh, when we came to you with a conversation about the recession plan and our revenue projections, the city cut back on a lot of expenditures uh, during that quarter. And we, we cut uh, over $1.3 million, again, positioning our, our city better at June 30th of last fiscal year. Our budget team is meeting consistently uh, two to three times a week and having conversations about expenditures. Uh, reviewing anything that's over 50, 15,000, as well as any personnel requests and filling those positions as we have a hiring freeze in place. And really it's the highly essential positions that we are, we're approving uh, moving forward. The employee COLA cost of living adjustment is currently on hold until we can see our revenue projections improving significantly. Several capital equipments have been deferred already in many funds throughout the organization. And non-essential travel, of course, is eliminated for our city, as well as many other things that are in that significant stage. We are uh, watching, taking care of, and uh, assuring that our expenditures align with where our revenues may be at our year end. And with that, I talked through a, a lot of numbers and a lot of information, and I, I thank you for, for hearing this update, and I am here to answer any questions. Okay, um, Ms. Whelan, you had a question. Not really, Mayor, I had a comment, and I would just like to take a minute and thank all of you, uh, city manager, leadership, budget team, finance team, you know, your, your whole plan of us going into this, the scenarios, one, two, three, four, I mean, it was just quite brilliant. Um, the, the ability to be flexible and nimble and then willingness to look at this every month. Um, I, just, I just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you for taking good care of our city. I know we are absolutely not done with this, but I rest assured we're in good hands, whatever direction that we're going in. So I, I just needed to say thank you so much uh, for your foresight, your intelligence, and your willingness uh, to to move us forward, even in times where we are so very, very challenged. Um, so thank you. Council, are there any other comments? I would just like to say um, thank you to um, uh, Mr. Clifton, to Mr. Tatter and the rest of the staff. Um, I do appreciate the fact that uh, we have a fiscal responsibility uh, plan and direction um, for our city and the work that we are doing. Um, and I encourage um, I encourage us to stay the course. 
I do believe that um, things may get difficult, um, but because we have such a good plan and we are monitoring it, I know without doubt that we will be able to um, weather this storm. I'm going to go to Mr. Um, Odegaard, followed by the vice mayor. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I, I just really, again, wanted to say thank you to everybody and thank you to Rick for the presentation um, and really say thank you from the community to the city team uh, for your fiscal responsibility. Um, I know uh, property tax uh, notices uh, were sent out and and I believe for the most part, um, people that have a residential home actually from the city of Flagstaff might have saw their tax bill go down. Didn't go down much, a few cents, but um, but I, said, I think that says a lot to the Flagstaff city team and to the council body uh, currently and the council body in the past that I had the pleasure of serving with about fiscal responsibility for the city. Um, so again, thank you very much. It was good information. Okay, we're gonna go to the vice mayor. Thank you, Mayor, and, and thank you, um, Mr. Tatter and, and city staff and, and team that worked on this. Um, very interesting to learn about our current snapshot of our financial situation and in some of the breakdowns of what's on the up and up and what's not doing so hot. I just wanted to take a moment and just recognize all the, the you know, we, we've heard today from this morning till more recently in the conversation that, you know, hotels and short-term rentals are, are on the down and um, same with restaurants and bars and, and a lot of low wage workers do um, work at these types of establishments and there's a lot of jobs that have been lost in our community. Um, and I just want to acknowledge all those workers who are struggling today to make it work. Um, you know, I'm, gl I'm glad that the city has a plan. The plan makes sense. It seems like we're on a pretty good track. And and we have, you know, fortunately some, some things that are really keeping us afloat in a positive way, although these are challenging times and, 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 and we're not through this, nowhere near that. Anyways, um, thank you for your work on this. Um, it'll help me sleep tonight. <laughs> and I appreciate your your, con your continued communication on it and, and look forward to future conversations about this as well. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, well, with that, we're gonna move on to our next our next topic. And our next topic is a COVID-19 update. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Shannon Anderson, Deputy City Manager for the City of Flagstaff. Tonight we're... Hello? Shannon, we might have just lost you. I think you did. I'm, I'm back. Thank you. <laughs> so tonight we are going to go over um, a data update uh, as well as review some of the things that we've talked about over the last several months. Um, one being the applying of the CDC explanations to our City of Flagstaff monitoring criteria. We will also go over the reentry plan phases one and two and then talk about the reentry of the public into city facilities that has occurred since September 14th and future plans, and then we'll pass it over to Council so that you can ask City staff any questions that you might have and have a discussion about the re-entry. Shannon, I don't think we can hear you. Sorry, I'm not sure why that keeps cutting in and out. I will try to watch that a little bit closely. Thanks, Thanks Mayor. Um, so this is the number of weekly cases that we have here in Coconino County. Um, as you can see here, Flagstaff is the blue line. And so over the last couple of weeks, we've seen a spike of 108 the week ending September 12th and 178 the week ending September 19th. Oops. 
So this is actually the number of daily cases. Wanted to show you what's happened since that September 19th number. We see another spike here in the middle of the week. Um, these amount, the 4, 41, 42, 44, et cetera, amounts to 174 cases um, that we are anticipating to see from September 20th through September 26th. Um, but again, those are preliminary numbers. It doesn't include the electronic lab reporting, and so we will not get a complete report of that time frame um, until this following Friday. So this next chart goes over the hospital admissions. Um, this is the weekly case counts for all of Coconino County residents. You'll see we've been fairly stable from week to week. Um, again, seeing six the week ending September 12th and five the week of uh, September 19th. When we look at the number of COVID related deaths, again for Coconino County residents, um, saw a slight uptick this last week from one to two. When we're looking at our community transmission here uh, in Coconino County, remember that we have three benchmarks. One, the number of cases per 100,000, percent positivity of cases, and then the percent of COVID-like illnesses. So for the percent of, excuse me, the number of cases, we are at 198 per 100,000, which puts us in the substantial community transmission level. When we look at our percent of positivity, we have a positivity of 7%, which is in the moderate level of transmission. And then when we look at our COVID-like illnesses, that's 3.2%, so again, minimal level. So given all this information, uh, the county reported that our, um, we are currently in the moderate level of community transmission. So this is the dashboard from the Arizona Department of Health Services. I want to point out that these are two different timeframes that we're looking at. So the numbers we just went through through the county went through September 19th. This data is only through September 6th. Um, again, the state is showing the county at a moderate level. Um, and you can see again, the numbers that they're looking at of the cases per 100,000, the percent positivity, and the percent for COVID like illnesses. So same benchmarks, just a different time frame. The reason this is important to us is because this impacts our ability to open our indoor gyms and fitness facilities. Moving now to the Northern Arizona Healthcare Hospital Census. Uh, this is a, as of last week. Um, and our numbers for the positive cases as well as the pending cases both went down. Um, the good news is, is we still have capacity in our hospital. Uh, to care for those who are seriously ill. So our next section we're going to look at is applying the CDC guidelines to the monitoring criteria. We went over this a few months ago uh, with staff and council. Um, I'll just remind everyone that our monitoring criteria is looking for a downward trajectory of the number of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths over four weeks or more. We're also looking to see that those in our community are following CDC guidelines and that our healthcare facilities have the capacity to care for those who are seriously ill, and that our community has the ability to provide testing, monitoring, and contact tracing. When we look at downward trajectory, CDC guidance is looking over 14 days. City of Flagstaff, we're looking at four weeks or more. The grace period, again, looking at that 14 days, a grace period is defined as five days. Um, during a 14 day downward trajectory. So for the city of Flagstaff, we defined a grace period as two weeks during that four week downward trajectory. The rebound criteria is five days of consecutive increase, again for a 14 day downward trajectory. So for the city of Flagstaff, we're looking for two consecutive weeks of increased numbers and then a rebound has been met. So how we apply this to our current scenario is that we have seen an increase over the last two weeks, two consecutive weeks, the week of September 12th and then the week of September 19th. So we have met the criteria for a rebound in a downward trajectory. 
I'm going to stop there and just ask if any council members have any questions. Uh, Mayor, if you can let me know, I'm unable to see the chat when I'm sharing my screen. We have a question by Mr. Uh, excuse me, Vice Mayor. Mayor, I believe Councilmember Odegaard had a comment as well. I don't see one. Where did I miss one? It's right before mine, but. Um, Sorry, okay. that must be a mistake on my part, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Oh, weird. Okay, no worries. Anyways, thank you, Mayor. So, thank you, WC and Anderson, for the update. You know, I just want to point out on this slide, we're not just seeing two weeks of an upward trend. I mean, we're 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 blasting off, right? We're almost as as high in our count as we were at our peak in June. Um, pretty darn quick here, and and. And if you go back to the slide that talks about the mo the different categories, I think it's a few slides ago. Yes. So it seems like to me that we obviously have many cases in our community. They're just amongst the population of which doesn't show illness, COVID-like illness. Um, and that just means to me again that these are students and younger folks that are for the most part asymptomatic and and it's concerning you know because they might be fine but you know they're passing it on to other folks that can very well change the you know impact of covid and so i do have concerns about um considering that we're considering us to be in a moderate category just given you know just how how dangerous this, the, the circumstance can be for certain populations. My, my question is, you talked about gyms reopening. Can you just re-mention that one more time? I didn't fully catch it. Sure, I'd be happy to, Vice Mayor Shimoni. Um, the ADHS dashboard, um, this was created um, as a way of monitoring the, uh, the transmission level of each of the counties because that is one of the measurements that ADHS is looking for prior to um, increasing the number of participations that can be indoor gyms and fitness facilities. It's increasing um, the number of individuals that can go into a restaurant. It's um, related to water parks, uh, the capacity in movie theaters. So those items that the governor closed through his executive order um, they're, they're looking at this dashboard as one of the measurements, and then they're also having those um, individual businesses submit an attestation talking about um, basically what their safety protocols are to ensure that individuals that are coming into their establishment um, are going to have a safe experience with the pandemic. So given that we're in the moderate category, um, does that mean, Jim's um, everything's a go, right? It does mean that if gyms have received approval from ADHS that they can have 25% uh, capacity at this point in time because we're still at the moderate transmission level. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions at this time? Okay, Ms. Anderson, continue. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so now we'll briefly review um, two of the phases within the reentry plan. Uh, phase two uh, was where we were prior to September 14th. Um, again, this is when city operations and meetings were functioning remotely. The majority of city facilities were closed to public entry. The essential services um, were still performed in person and on site. So this would be, you know, our streets um, crew, uh, police, fire, as well as building inspectors. Special events and permits were um, limited. Most of the outdoor park and court amenities were open during this phase, and the visitor center also opened on a limited basis. Travel and group gatherings uh, were suspended, or they could be held remotely during phase two. So then we moved to phase three on September 14th. Um, we did open city facilities with limited services. Uh, we continue to have our city meetings remotely. Seating areas within the buildings that have opened have been closed. Um, if we've been unable to move uh, the furniture out of those areas, we have put signage to discourage congregating. 
Protective measures have been put in place, uh, so you'll see queuing mechanisms as to where people enter and exit the building, uh, where they would stand to ensure that they are six feet apart from one another, and then any areas that are off limit to the public. We also are continuing to emphasize working remotely and indoor recreation facilities we've been talking about and preparing for potential opening, uh, but none, none have opened at this point in time. Uh, special events and permits are less limited, so they now can be up to 50 people and travel is still limited. So now we're going to go over um, the re-entry of the public into city facilities. So this will actually talk about the buildings that have opened and what they look like. Uh, so I'll review City Hall and then I will pass it over to Jared Tolman to go over the city libraries. Uh, so for City Hall, we are open Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. We do have limited access in the building, so public can go into the main lobby area where the customer service counters are located. The public entrance and exit is from Aspen Avenue, but if somebody needs ADA access, they would come in from the west entrance with a call to our front desk, so those doors can be opened for their arrival. We also are holding meetings remotely when feasible. So I'll pass it over to you, Jared. Just let me know when you're ready to go to the next slide. Thanks, Shannon. Madam Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor and Council, Jared Tolman, your city and county library director. Um, so the downtown library has opened again Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. with uh, computer reservations. Patrons can go online, they can call in, they can come up to the doors to make a reservation for a computer. Uh, session. Um, each hour we have a limit of seven individuals and one family for uh, computer reservations. Each one of those reservations are for a limit of 45 minutes. This allows us a 15 minute window between each session to disinfect, sanitize the computers before they're used again uh, by other staff or by other patrons, I should say. And then we are also continuing our curbside service and telephone assistance online services um, so that people can continue to get the other services they were they're needing. Um, before we opened up to the public on September 14th, we were only able to provide those, some services through that curbside and, and through the telephone and online services. But now that the library has reopened, we can now help people get back on to uh, computers for those who don't have them. Shannon, next side, slide, please. The East Side Library is also opened. It's open Monday and Wednesday from 2 o'clock to 6 o'clock and Friday and Saturday from 10 o'clock to 2 p.m. Um, their system is a little bit different because their uh, facility is a little bit smaller. The limit for individual sessions are four individuals and one family for computer sessions. Again, it's still a 45 minute uh, window allowing us time, 15 minutes to go in and, and clean up um, in between so that we're keeping people safe. And um, I should mention that both the main library and the East library the reason that we've limited the number of individuals that can come in during a session is so that we can spread them out and that there's a six foot distance in between uh, individuals using the computers so that we're not overcrowding and, and observing those social distancing. Shannon, next slide. Thanks, Jared. I will pass it over to uh, Rebecca, Amy, and John to go over Parks and Recreation. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is Rebecca Sayers, Parks and Recreation Director. So our outdoor park and court amenities are fully open. We That means all of our uh, public restrooms and our parks are open now, as well as our um, picnic tables and ramadas. Special events and permits are limited to groups of 50, which Shannon mentioned. And we do have permitted field use for uh, mostly our youth sports leagues, but we are not permitting tournaments at this time. Next slide, please. For our recreation facilities, uh, Jay Lively Ice Rink, I believe at our last update a few weeks ago, I mentioned that we were trying to 
uh, target a end of the month opening date for Jay Lively and then a later date in October for our other recreation facilities. We have now put those plans a little bit on hold just because of this increase in numbers and the cautious approach that we are taking. So we now do not have a tentative opening date due to the recent increase in cases. However, we have returned our part-time staff from furlough so that we can get them in the facility training on our new protocols for safety and cleaning, as well as uh, revisiting their previous training, for example, running the Zamboni at the ice rink, so that they are ready to flip a switch when we believe it's safe to do so. Uh, for the Arizona Department of Health Services requirements for indoor gyms and fitness centers, we have met those requirements. We do have our attestations filed at the state and they are approved. So when it's safe to reopen, we can. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so at this point, I will turn it over to Jeannie Gallagher so she can talk a little bit about um, how we are trying to assist our employees in balancing school closures um, and the work that they do on behalf of the city. Thank you, Shannon, and good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. This is Jeannie Gallagher, your Human Resource Director. Um, as Shannon mentioned, um, primarily um, we're working on uh, continuing to work on a fairly remote basis. So uh, working remotely um, is continuing to be encouraged um, and supported, uh, not only through uh, flex time, uh, we continue to have employees working uh, an extremely interesting variation of schedule uh, to accommodate staffing um, as well as kind of that AD shift, uh, continuing to keep uh, employees separated. Um, so we have 10 hour shifts and 12 hour shifts and AD schedules, et cetera. Um, and we are also continuing to offer um, as a, appropriately um, access to flexibility in our leave program um, as we can. Um, we have the CARES Act leave program um, that we're continuing to support as well as making um, as many opportunities and access to uh, the uh, leave programs that were in place here at the city and making them accessible to our employees um, so they continue to be able to have compensation um, to support their needs to balance um, their uh, work and life. And then, of course, our paid time off program. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, Mayor, I don't know if there's any questions that Council might have, but I'll leave the presentation up in case we want to go back to any of the slides. Mayor, did I lose you? I apologize. There's a question from Ms. Whelan followed by Mr. Odegaard. Thank you. Mayor, I withdrew my question. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Odegaard. Um, yeah, uh, my question is um, concerning, um, especially the indoor facilities, like for example, the ice skating rink. Um, you know, yes, we've seen a spike increase from the one graph that was presented. Um, and the bullet points is when we think it's uh, uh, safe to do so of opening the um, ice rink. I was wondering, uh, will it again, uh, maybe if Miss Anderson could explain um, what that uh, safe to do so would be. Um, with the matrix uh, graph going up and a spike in that, that two week period, if explain when safe would be if the 
graph would go in a downward trajectory for two weeks or three weeks, four weeks. I know there's always, you know, a continue time period of decline. Um, so maybe if Miss Anderson could explain um, when it would be safe to do so of reopening the ice skating rink. So the residents that I'm sure are listening in would kind of expect when they might see a, a, a reopening. Thank you, Councilmember Odegaard. Um, so I pulled up the uh, weekly COVID cases because uh, I think that's a good chart to use. Um, and we can reference the spike that we saw um, back in uh, middle to end of June where we had uh, a couple of, we had two consecutive weeks of increases. Um, from that point, we actually waited for the four or more weeks of downward trajectory prior to considering moving into phase three. That's the black and white answer. Um, we're here today because um, some have asked, you know, is this the appropriate time to roll back to phase two? Some have asked, do we stop opening additional facilities? Um, so we really are looking for council sentiment as to how you would like to proceed. If we followed the black and white CDC, we would be looking for another four or more weeks of downward trajectory based on the monitoring criteria that we adopted. Does, does uh, that, thank you, Ms. Anderson. So um, staff is looking for direction. So are you fine with us staying where we are, Mr. Odegaard, um, following what we've adopted? Uh, yes, um, I'm fine where we're at. Um, I totally understand about holding off of, of reopening uh, some indoor facilities just because of the recent spike. Um, so I, I'm fine with kind of a holding pattern of kind of a wait and see. I, I'm not my wish is to kind of roll back to phase two at this point knowing without getting a little bit more, see where we're at as far as the data. Mr. Aslan. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the presentation, staff. Um, I, don't, I don't know what to say. I mean, look at the graph we're all looking at. We're heading in the wrong direction. Um, I think it's very prudent for us to uh, stay the course right now and, and not make any further changes. In fact, it, it might even be time to start discussing going back to where we were uh, in August. <clears throat> um, when I was concerned that this very thing uh, would bear out in the trend. Um, but uh, for the time being, um, I think the most prudent thing to do is to just maintain. Thank you, Mr. Aslan. Mr. McCarthy. I, I think my comments parallel uh, Mr. Aslan's comments very closely. Thank you. Could other council members please weigh in? Mm, Vice Mayor followed by Ms. Whelan. Yeah, mine, mine too. Thank you, Mayor, are in line with the last two speakers, Councilmember Aslan and, and McCarthy, I really do think we're heading in the wrong direction and it's concerning. And understand the population impacted don't show symptoms and aren't impacted the same as others in our community, but I think we're just playing with fire and it's, it's dangerous. So I'm, I'm very concerned. Thank you. Ms. Whelan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a question uh, for Rebecca. Now, we have um, set policy that in other buildings we can have up to 50 individuals. Is that correct? Or is that only outside? And maybe it's not for you, Rebecca. Maybe it's for someone else. I'm happy to, I, I'm sorry, Council Member Whelan, I'm having trouble hearing the question, but I think your question was about groups of 50. Is that correct? Yes. yes. So we are, uh, 
I could let Shannon address uh, events or groups on private property. Mm -hmm. On city property, we are now uh, permitting events up to 50. And our sport groups that are on our fields that are permitted are limited to 50 per field. Okay, but th th that's because it's an outside venue, correct? We're, we're not allowing or permitting any activities within any city buildings that have 50 uh, individuals in, are we? Shannon, no, that is... I'm that sorry. is correct. I, I'm sorry. I was referring to everything outdoors. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. So what is your direction, Ms. Whelan? Um, you know, I do have concerns about some of our families driving down to Phoenix. I mean, it, it weighs heavy on me. And as the weather changes, um, it weighs even heavier. Um, but I, I would agree with my colleagues that we stay put uh, where we are. Ms. Salas. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, stay the course. And so I, I would just add that um, when you look at the, the draft, we are just about back to the first, second week of June. I think that if I could just um, ask city staff, um, our city manager, excuse me, um, Mr. Clifton, we did an awesome job through our CVB and um, Ms. Hansen's group talking about the need to wear a mask talking about the need to wash your hands and to socially distance. Um, I, I do think that if we could relaunch that, I think it's still going, but if we could maybe double down on our efforts to really promote that, especially going into flu season and going into a period where we're going to start spending more and more time indoors. Um, I really think that that's critical um, because that graph seems to be headed straight up. And so I would just ask that. I see Ms. Hansen. Mayor and Vice Mayor Council Members Heidi Hansen, Economic Vitality Director. Um, I'll definitely get with the Discover Flagstaff team and we will increase what we're doing locally with our badge um, to remind them about all the things the mayor just mentioned. And um, I will make sure that uh, we already have some some information going out to uh, visitors again not encouraging the visit but explaining how we want them to act when they're here and i'll make sure that um we're definitely um in to the phoenix market as much as we can be because that is the drive market that we're seeing the most of so i'll make sure that we um increase all those efforts thank you thank you anything else um council not seeing anything else, uh, we'll go ahead and move to, well, we have something, um, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess you didn't see my last question, but um, I didn't. that's okay. Um, I know it's getting late and I think we're all getting tired really quick. You know, I, I just, along the same lines as what you were saying, Mayor, I was thinking, you know, obviously the, the situation is, in my opinion, very much alive on an EU's campus and so, I'm just wondering if we can double down on our partnership with NAU to communicate and work through the kinks. I know that they just hired, you know, their, their contact tracers not too long ago in partnership with the county, but um, I, I don't know what the solution is. I'm just trying to address the issue. And I think the issue is surrounding NAU. And so, um, yeah, maybe, maybe you know, pulling in Valeria Chase, our liaison to NAU, community liaison. Um, maybe even next time we speak about COVID, pulling in NAU representation to talk about what else can be done and, and what we can do moving forward to um, better mitigate the situation. Um, yeah, that's just where my mind's at. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Odegaard. 
Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I, I just wanted to follow up what the Vice Mayor said in that uh, he is correct. Uh, you know, most of the community, uh, especially those that are here uh, locally, do a, I, my opinion, a really good job uh, wearing a facial covering when appropriate. But I have been seeing as of late of uh, the younger uh, generation, uh, especially students, maybe not uh, abiding by the facial covering when it's appropriate. And so I, I do agree with the vice mayor. If there could be some type of effort led uh, with a discussion with any of you about how do we get the messaging out to that student population that we still need to be visual. We still need to be uh, wearing facial covering uh, when it's appropriate. So I want to just want to say thank you, vice mayor, because I, I do believe we do need to uh, partner with any of you of getting that messaging out. And so I would just add, while well, I do think that we need to partner with any of you and gain that message out, um, I just want to strongly, um, strongly state that any of you received funding specifically around COVID. And um, I feel that perhaps part of that discussion with NAU, while they are doing the contract testing, it might be that we encourage them to use their funding in ways that really get to their students and help, um, help them market and talk to their students about the importance of wearing the mask. I also want to say that there is an assumption that um, all of the young people that we see not wearing masks are students, um, and that is not the case um, necessarily. So um, I just want to make sure that we understand that. So with that, if we're done with this item, we'll move on to our next item. Our next item is item number 11. This is public participation. This is for items that were not on our agenda tonight. Um, City Clerk, is there anything for public participation? Not tonight, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go then to our um, next agenda item, which is going to be informational items to and from the Mayor, Council, City Manager, and future agenda item requests. We're going to start with the Vice Mayor tonight. Thank you, Mayor. Um, not a whole lot to report. I just want to give a shout out to the County Recorder's Office for setting up a mobile voting trailer on NAU's campus through the week. Um, it'll be outside of the Union between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. I, wa I want to say through through potentially Saturday, but I believe at least till Friday. Don't quote me on that, but they've been out there helping people check their registration and get registered if they need to. And I think that's a huge step. And I know they're setting up a drop box for ballots on North Campus, I believe it is as well. So that's great to hear about that partnership. Um, there's a couple Black Lived Experience meetings left, uh, part of the six-part forum. I want to say, Mayor, am I correct? And, and you can weigh in when it's your turn, but I'm, I'm, I believe there's this Thursday and then this upcoming Saturday. And I want to say those are the last two. Um, and I just wanted to let staff and the community know, be, you know, it's a great opportunity to learn about the Black Lives experience um, and hear different perspectives. And it's just, it's just a great opportunity to take this moment in history and, and really expand our own consciousnesses, you know, individually. Um, I think the window for the census is closed as of today, but there, I know that there's litigation and potentially a, another window um but that's that's a big deal and and I, I hope we do have more time to address the census and and obviously registration for voting is coming up in terms of its deadline so if you're not registered definitely please do get registered and get ready for this upcoming election um just wanted to give a shout out to nate hogg for the great summit virtual call this morning so that was very helpful, and um, and yeah, I, I look forward to all the things we're talking about in the weeks to come. Um, very good stuff we're working towards, and, and gra gratitude to leadership at NAU, or sorry, at the city, <coughs> and NAU, but more more so at the city. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Clifton. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, a quick response to the Vice Mayor, and thank you, Vice Mayor, for calling out the census. I may be wrong on this, but I do believe uh, that uh, 
it is still open at this time. Um, so even though we're at the 11th hour, uh, I, I'm not sure that it is too late at this point. Thank you. Mr. Aslan. Hello. Um, I don't have much. I would like to introduce uh, a fair item. If if there's another avenue for uh, or a more appropriate way for us to proceed with this idea, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> but I'll just throw it out there and we can figure out the best way to logistically tackle it. You know, I, I've been participating in as many of the Live Black Experience um, forums as I as I can. Uh, really enjoying them. I, I think they're they're very powerful, and I, I wish attendance was much much stronger. Um, and I hope we can continue having these kinds of conversations and bringing new listeners and new voices into the mix. Uh, one of the successes uh, for me about this was being involved in Saturday's discussion on the black economy in Flagstaff <clears throat> and having sort of a light bulb go off. And I didn't want to waste any time um, pursuing this idea. Uh, and it kind of came about a little bit organically, but I'm really excited to see where this will go. So, uh, you know, our Discover Flagstaff team has a wonderful walk the talk uh, program um, with augmented reality uh places around town where you can uh, tune in using your smartphone and learn about the history of the moon landing and the importance of all that to the Flagstaff community. I think we should do something similar with respect to the Black lived experience in the history of Flagstaff. I think there's a rich history there from um, uh, buildings that hosted businesses that were in green books um, to Buffalo Soldiers and, of course, our historic Black neighborhood um, stuff. Uh, I'd love to learn more about that history. I'd love that history to be available to anybody coming through. And it's the sort of thing that might just uh, facilitate, you know, uh, more Black tourism in Flagstaff. And that could only be good because as people come through town, they obviously fall in love with Flagstaff. And this is how we attract um, more diversity. Uh, so I, I, I see a comment from Heidi. Um, I'll go ahead and let her make her comment. But um, to the extent that this is something that would be appropriate to pursue through, you know, the, the, the future agenda item request avenue or not, um, I would love to see something happen. Uh, Mayor, Councilmember Aslan, um, just so you know, we're already working on it, and so you don't have to request the item. We'll actually get it on the working calendar when we're ready to uh, share that with you. But to the staff's been working on it for the past two months. And is and that I specific to the Green Book experience, or is it a broader sort of uh, Black history of flag staff? It's, it's a combination of both, but I'll definitely make sure that um, we're touching on what you're saying as well. But we are we are looking at history of buildings and and people um, and also how we are affiliated with the Green Book. But um, I'll definitely make sure that uh, we I've, I've written the note to make sure that we have what you want as well. But I'm not trying to say that we're we're awesome but the team is awesome and they definitely have already been working on this so we're going to be uh bringing it to you when it was completed great. we're going to bring it to you when it's completed that's super exciting to hear it's it's wonderful to know that great minds think alike um and also again just a a, a real shout out to the the platform of these black lived experience forums i think some good ideas are being um organically generated out of it and this is exactly the sort of uh, energy and innovative uh, momentum that I think we we're hoping to create by having this this space to talk through things that have never really been talked through before. And I look forward to seeing what you guys come up with. And and please don't consider my list of suggestions to be exhaustive by any stretch. I am sure there's a great rich history. Uh, black history and flag staff, uh, and I don't know what I don't know. So um, feel free to explore as far and wide as you can. Definitely. Thank you. Mr. McCarthy. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor. I would like to just give a very brief summary of the last Housing Commission meeting. We had two primary uh, agenda items. On one, uh, we went over all of the city-owned properties that have the potential for use for affordable housing in the future. That was a very interesting presentation. The other one was uh, a very detailed presentation on StarPoint, which is that new uh, uh, housing that's being built on Fort Valley Road. And just a quick summary, it'll be 77 units. 90% of them will be affordable. And all of the affordable unit, units will be permanently affordable. And they are one, two, and three bedrooms. And the rent, uh, depending on income level, can be as low as $492 a month. So that's just kind of a quick summary. Uh, some good news on that new, uh, uh, some new construction for affordable housing. Thank you. We're going to go to Mr. Odegaard. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, the only thing I wanted to uh, bring up uh, this evening um, that we received uh, an email from Miss Deb Harris last week about maybe doing some type of a community um, recognition of the COVID deaths that's happened um, across the country of taking a moment of silence uh, across the community or maybe uh, taking a moment of ringing of church bells, um, recognizing um, those that have passed because of COVID. Um, uh, and maybe I'll just as a follow-up, maybe to our uh, monthly meeting, uh, Mayor, is maybe this is something we can work with your uh, faith uh, liaison person to maybe yeah. to get the churches working together and doing some type of an event like that. So, and that's the only thing I had. So, thank you. Ms. Whelan. Nothing tonight. Thank you, Mayor. Ms. Alice. Ms. Oh. Alice. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I mean, just want to shout out, big shout out to Team Flag staff. Um, Thank you for everything you do and for our city. Um, I just, I just want to make sure that every member of Team Flag staff is well and um, well taken care of. Um, I also want to do a, a big shout out to the Discover Flag staff team and also announce the the annual um, virtual this time it's virtual um, stakeholders and partners meeting for discover flag staff it's on October uh, uh, 14 from nine o'clock to 10 30. Um, I also want to do a shout out for every business in Flagstaff who um, is investing in their business. I, I know some of the businesses have done some remodeling and some uh, improvement uh, during this time of pandemic. I also know, uh, and I think uh, another a major improvement, also a major um, effort has been done, which is in the front page of the Flagstaff Business News for, September, for the September issue, is um, one of the hotels, motels on um, historic Route 66, the, the Whispering Winds, which is under new management and it's remodeling and it's uh, uh, keeping up with the historic preservation of the the historic Route 66 um, spirit because there's a big following for a historic Route 66 uh, um, as, a, as a destination. Um, and I know there are uh, some more businesses out there who are qu quietly, you know, doing some remodeling and improvements in their business. 
as, as their way of, you know, uh, pivoting and rebounding. So thank you. City manager, I'm uh, sorry, Miss Whelan. Yes, Mayor. You're next. No, you already caught on me, Mayor. Oh, I went out of order. My bad. I apologize. <laughs> I have nothing. Thank you. I apologize. City manager. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Council. I'd like to thank the presenters tonight. Uh, and I'd like to thank Council for very thoughtful discussions. Once again, we covered a lot of ground. So thank you very much. That's all I have. So I just wanted to um, uh, first of all say uh, thank you to um, Heidi's team. Today was the NACOG virtual conference, annual conference. And the reason why I call out uh, Discover Flagstaff and the Vitality, um, the Economic Vitality Department specifically, as there was a um, there was a segment that had to do with tourism in Arizona, and um, what that is going to look like moving forward. Um, they were very clear, the Commerce Authority and the Arizona Department of Tourism, that tourism is our number one sector in Arizona and the number one sector in northern Arizona. And they were talking about how that looks in the world of COVID and uh, what does that mean. And there is a focus that they are going to be doing on um, on, on in interstate travel, meaning that people within the state um, now rediscover new places and go to new places. And everything they were talking about is everything that our team is already doing, from making sure that there's messaging about mask and safety, making sure that there's messaging about being able to get outdoors, um, and then making sure that uh, there is information regarding um, preservation of the places where you visit, right? So if you were out in the woods, making sure that you leave it um, the way you found it, or you leave it better than how you found it. And there is a, a website, so thank you very much, Ms. Hansen, that's rediscoverarizona.com. There is also going to be, uh, or there's proposed to be federal le uh, legislation um, that would be coming forth to actually help cities and towns um, as they try to uh, re-engage their tourism sector, um, realizing that this was the number one industry in most of the smaller town cities and towns in Arizona. And Leave No Trace is the name of the campaign um, that is active to make sure that when people do come into the woods, they leave no trace of the fact that they were there. So a shout out to um, our CVB and Ms. Hansen's um, group. I also want to follow up on something that the vice mayor said. There are two more, um, two more town halls scheduled uh, for the Black Lived Experience. Those are town halls. Those are different from the community dialogues, right? So the town halls, there's one this Thursday, and that has to do with uh, race, space, and segregation. And then there's one on Saturday that has to do with mental health. So those are the two out of the six that are remaining. Um, also, there is a, uh, a YouTube a YouTube channel in which you will find not only um, the first two town halls available for you to listen to this conversation, but also all of the... Um, the community dialogues have been happening, and those are those community dialogues that seem to be happening now once a week, but were every two weeks. Um, additionally, the group is going to be making sure that within a week after the end of the last town hall, all the town halls will be put up on a website, and the community will be encouraged to go and listen to the town halls at their leisure and then submit their own comments um, for an open comment period as they are working to write a strategic plan that has to do with the Live Black experience. There will also be the ability, um, there are going to be, I believe, two um, in-person, so socially distancing very safely with masks on, um, I think limited to 10 people at a time, um, sessions. So if anybody is interested in doing that, they are planning those. And I believe the word will be out on those um, next week sometime. So that's all I have for an update tonight. I would like to say thank you, Council. Um, I realize that it's late, but we had great conversations today. And I appreciate the civility that we continue to um, afford to each other um, at the dais, um, even though the dais is virtually. And so with that, if there's nothing else, we are adjourned.